Section 26 of Dangerous Connections. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos. Section 26, letters 126 to 130. Letter of 126. Madame de Rosemonde to the President de Tourvelle. I should have replied to you before, my amiable child, if the fatigue consequent on my last letter had not brought back my pains, which have once more deprived me during these last days of the use of my arm. I was most anxious to thank you for the good news which you have given me of my nephew, and I was no less eager to offer you my sincere congratulations on your own count. One is forced to recognize in this a real effect of providence, which by touching the heart of one has also saved the other. Yes, my dearest fair, God, who only wished to try you, has succored you at a moment when your strength was exhausted, and in spite of your little murmur, you owe him, methinks, your thanksgiving. It is not that I do not feel it would have been more agreeable to you if this resolution had come to you first, and that Belmont's had been only the consequence of it. It seems even, humanly speaking, that the rights of our sex would have been better preserved, and we would not lose any of them. But what are these slight considerations in view of the important objects which have been obtained? Does a man who has been saved from shipwreck complain that he has not had a choice of means? You will soon find, my dear daughter, that the sorrow which you dread will alleviate itself, and even if it were to subsist for ever and in its entirety, you would none the less feel that it was still easier to endure than remorse for crime and contempt of yourself. It would have been useless for me to speak to you earlier with this apparent severity. Love is an involuntary sentiment which prudence can avoid, but which it could not vanquish, and which, once born, dies only by its fine death or from the absolute lack of hope. It is this last case in which you are which gives me the courage and the right to tell you frankly my opinion. It is cruel to alarm one hopelessly sick who is no longer susceptible to aught save consolations and palliation. But it is right to enlighten a convalescent as to the dangers he has incurred, in order to inspire him with that prudence of which he has need, and with submission to counsels which may still be necessary to him. Since you choose me for your physician, it is as such that I speak to you and that I tell you that the little indisposition which you experience at present, and which perhaps demands some remedies, is nothing in comparison with the alarming malady from which your recovery is assured. Next, as your friend, as the friend of a reasonable and virtuous woman, I will permit myself to add that this passion which has subjugated you, already so unfortunate in itself, became even more so through its object. If I am to believe what is told me, my nephew, whom I confess I love, perhaps to weakness, and who indeed unites many laudable qualities to many attractions, is not without danger for women. There are women whom he has wronged, and he sets almost an equal price upon their seduction and their ruin. Indeed, I believe that you may have converted him. Never was there a person more worthy to do this. But so many others have flattered themselves with the same thought, and their hopes have been deceived, that I love better far to think you should not be reduced to this resource. Consider now, my dearest fair, that instead of the many risks you would have had to run, you will have, besides the repose of your conscience and your own peace of mind, the satisfaction of having been the principal cause of Valmont's happy reformation. For myself, I do not doubt, but that this is in large part the result of your courageous resistance, and that a moment of weakness on your part might have left my nephew, perhaps, in eternal error. 
I love to think so, and desire to see you think the same. You will find in that your first consolations, and I fresh reasons for loving you more. I expect you here within a few days, my amiable daughter, as you have announced. Come and recover calm and happiness in the same spot where you had lost it. Come above all to rejoice with your fond mother that you have so happily kept the word you gave her, to do nothing unworthy of her or of yourself. At the Chateau de 30th October, 17. Letter the 127th The Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont if i have not replied to your letter of the nineteenth vicomte it is not that i have not had the time it is quite simply that it put me in a bad humour and that i found it lacking in common sense i thought therefore that i could not do better than leave it in oblivion but since you come back to it, since you appear to cling to the ideas it contains and take my silence for consent, I must tell you plainly what I think. I may sometimes have had the pretension to replace in my single person a whole seraglio, but it has never suited me to make a part of one. I thought you knew this. Now, at least, when you can no longer be ignorant of it, you will easily imagine how absurd your proposal must have appeared to me. I, indeed, I am to sacrifice a fancy, and a fresh fancy, moreover, in order to occupy myself with you. And to occupy myself in what way? By awaiting my turn like a submissive slave for the sublime favours of your highness. Well, forsooth, you want a moment's distraction from that unknown charm which the adorable, the celestial Madame de Tourvel has alone made you experience, or when you are afraid of compromising, in the eyes of the seductive Cecile, the superior idea which it is your good pleasure that she should preserve of you. Then, condescending even to myself, you will come in search of pleasures, less keen in truth, but without consequence, and your precious bounties, although somewhat rare, will, nevertheless, suffice for my happiness. You certainly are rich in your good opinion of yourself, but apparently I am not equally so in modesty. For, however I may look at myself, I cannot find myself reduced to such a point. Perhaps this is a fault of mine, but I warn you I have many others also. I have, in especial, that of believing that the schoolboy, the mawkish Danceny, who is solely occupied with me and sacrifices to me, without making merit of it, a first passion, even before it has been satisfied, who, in a word, loves me as one loves at his age, may work more effectively than you, for all his twenty years, to secure my happiness and my pleasure. I will even permit myself to add that, if it were my whim to give him an assistant, it would not be you, at any rate not at this moment. And for what reasons do you ask me? But to begin with, there might very well be none, for the caprice which might make me prefer you could equally cause your exclusion. However, I am quite willing, out of politeness, to give you the reason of my opinion. It seems to me that you would have too many sacrifices to make me, and I, instead of being grateful for them, as you would not fail to expect, should be capable of believing that you were still my debtor. You quite see that, far as we are from each other in our fashion of thinking, we cannot come together again in any manner, and I am afraid that it might need time, a long time, before I should change my sentiments. When I am converted, I promise I will inform you. 
Until then, believe me, make other arrangements and keep your kisses. You have so many better occasions to dispose of them. Adieu, as of old, say you. But of old, it seems to me, you took a little more account of me. You had not relegated me entirely to minor parts, and, above all, you were quite willing to wait until I had said yes, before making sure of my consent. Be satisfied, if, instead of bidding you also adieu as of old, I bid you adieu as at present. Your servant, Monsieur le Vicomte. At the Chateau de... 31st October, 17. Letter the 128th. The President de Tourvel to Madame de Rosemonde. I only received yesterday, Madame, your tardy reply. It would have killed me on the instant, if my existence had still been in my own hands. But another is its possessor, and that other is Monsieur de Valmont. You see that I hide nothing from you. If you must consider me no longer worthy of your friendship, I fear even less to lose it than to retain it by guile. All that I can tell you is that, placed by Monsieur de Valmont between his death or his happiness, I resolved in favour of the latter. I neither vaunt myself on this nor accuse myself. I simply state the fact. You will easily understand after this what impression your letter must have made upon me, with the severe truths which it contains. Do not believe, however, that it was able to give birth to a regret in me, nor that it can ever cause me to change in sentiment or in conduct. It is not that I do not have cruel moments, but when I fear that I can no longer endure my torments, I say to myself, Valmont is happy, and all vanishes before this idea, or rather it converts all into pleasures. It is to your nephew, then, that I have devoted myself. It is for him that I have ruined myself. He has become the one centre of my thoughts, my sentiments, my actions. As long as my life is necessary to his happiness it will be precious to me, and I shall deem it fortunate. If some day he thinks differently, he shall hear from me neither complaint nor reproach. I have already dared to cast my eyes upon that fatal moment and I have resolved on my course. You see now how little I need be affected by the fear you seem to have, lest one day Monsieur de Valmont should ruin me, for ere he can wish for that he will have ceased to love me, and what will then be vain reproaches to me which I shall not hear? He alone shall be my judge. As I shall have lived but for him, it will be in him that my memory shall repose, and if he is forced to admit that I loved him, I shall be sufficiently justified. You have now read, madame, in my heart. I preferred the misfortune of losing your esteem by my frankness to that of rendering myself unworthy of it by the degradation of a lie. I thought I owed this complete confidence to the kindness you have shown me. To add one word more would be to lead you to suspect that I have the vanity to count upon it still, when on the contrary I do myself justice in ceasing to pretend to it. I am, with respect, madame, your most humble and obedient servant. Paris, 1st November, 17, blank. Letter the 129th, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. Tell me, then, my lovely friend, whence comes the tone of bitterness and banter which prevails in your last letter pray what crime have i committed apparently without suspecting it which put you in such ill humour you reproach me with having the air of counting on your consent before i had obtained it but i believed that what might seem presumption in the case of everybody could never be taken between you and me for aught save confidence and since when has that sentiment done detriment to friendship or to love in uniting hope to desire 
i did but yield to the natural impulse which makes us ever place the happiness we seek as near to us as possible and you took for the effect of pride what was no more than the result of my eagerness i know mighty well that custom has introduced in such a case a respectful doubt but you also know that it is but a form a mere protocol and i was authorized it seems to me to believe that these minute precautions were no longer necessary between us methinks even that this free and frank method when it is founded on an old liaison is far preferable to the insipid flattery which so often takes the relish out of love <sighs> perhaps moreover the value which i find in this manner does but come from that which i attach to the happiness which it recalls to me but for that very cause it would be more painful still for me to see you judge of it otherwise <clears throat> that however is the only error which i am conscious of for i do not imagine that you could have thought seriously that there existed any woman in the world whom i could prefer to you and even less that i could appreciate you so ill as you feign to believe you have looked at yourself you tell me in this connection and you have not found yourself reduced to such a point i well believe it and it proves that you have a faithful mirror but could you not have drawn the conclusion with more ease and justice that i was very certain not to have judged you so i seek in vain for a cause for this strange idea it seems however that it is due more or less to the praises i have permitted myself to make of other women at least i infer it from your affectation of picking out the epithets adorable celestial seductive which i made use of in speaking to you of madame de tourvel or of the little volange but are you not aware that these words more often used by chance than from reflection are less expressive of the account one takes of the person than of the situation in which one finds oneself at the time of speaking and if at the very moment when i was keenly affected either by one or the other i was none the less desirous of you if i showed you a marked preference over both of them since in short i could not renew our former liaison except to the prejudice of the two others i do not find in that so great a matter for reproach it will be no more difficult for me to justify myself as to the unknown charm with which you seem to be also somewhat shocked for to begin with it does not result that it is stronger from the fact that it is unknown oh, who could give it the palm over the delicious pleasures which you alone know how to render always fresh as they are always keen i did but wish to tell you therefore that it was of a kind which i had not experienced before but i did not pretend to assign a class to it and i added what i repeat to-day that whatever it may be i shall know how to combat and to conquer it i shall bring even more zeal to this if i can see in this trivial task a homage to be offered to you as for the little cecile i think it hardly necessary to speak of her to you you have not forgotten that it was at your request that i charged myself with the child 
and i only await your permission to be rid of her i may have remarked upon her ingenuousness and freshness i may even for a moment have thought her seductive because in a more or less degree one always takes pleasure in one's own handiwork but assuredly she is not in any way of sufficient consequence to fix one's attention upon her and now my lovely friend i appeal to your justice to your first kindness for me to the long and perfect friendship the entire confidence which has since welded the bonds between us have i deserved the severe tone which you adopt with me but how easy it will be for you to compensate me for it when you like say but one word and you will see whether all the charms and all the seductions will detain me here not for a day but for a minute i will fly to your feet and into your arms and i will prove to you a thousand times and in a thousand manners that you are that you will ever be the true sovereign of my heart adieu my lovely friend i await your reply with much eagerness paris third november seventeen Letter the hundred and thirtieth, Madame de Rosemonde to the President de Tourvel. And why, my dearest fair, would you cease to be my child? Why do you seem to announce to me that all correspondence will cease between us? Is it to punish me for not having guessed what was against all probability? Or do you suspect me of having guided you willfully? nay i know your heart too well to believe that it can think thus of mine the pain therefore which your letter caused me is far less relative to me than to yourself o oh, my youthful friend i tell it you with sorrow you are far too worthy of being loved that ever love should make you happy ah what woman who was truly delicate and sensitive has not found misfortune in this very sentiment which promised her so much felicity do men know how to appreciate the woman they possess tis not that many are not honourable in their actions and constant in their affections but even amongst these how few know how to put themselves in unison with our hearts do not suppose my dear child that their love is like our own indeed they experience the same intoxication often even they bring more ardour to it but they do not know that anxious eagerness that delicate solicitude which causes in us those tender and constant cares of which the beloved object is ever the single aim the man's pleasures lie in the happiness which he feels the woman's in that which she bestows this difference so essential and so little noticed has however a very sensible influence on the sum of their respective conduct the pleasure of the one is ever to gratify his desires that of the other is especially to arouse them to please with him is but a means to success whereas with her it is success itself and coquetry with which women are so often reproached is nothing else than the abuse of this manner of feeling and by that very fact proves its reality in short that exclusive taste which particularly characterizes love is in the man naught but a preference serving at the most to enhance a pleasure which perhaps another object would diminish but would not destroy whilst in women it is a profound sentiment which not only destroys every extraneous desire but which stronger than nature and removed from its dominion 
allows them to experience only repugnance and disgust at the very point where pleasure seems to be born and do not deem that more or less numerous exceptions which one might quote can successfully contradict these general truths they are guaranteed by the public voice which has distinguished infidelity from inconstancy for men alone a distinction by which they prevail when they should be humiliated and which for our sex has never been adopted save by those depraved women who are its shame and to whom all means seem good which they hope can save them from the painful feeling of their baseness i had thought my dearest fair that it might be of use to you to have these reflections to oppose the chimerical ideas of perfect happiness with which love never fails to abuse our imagination the lying spirit to which one still clings even when forced to abandon it and the loss of which irritates and multiplies the sorrows already too real that are inseparable from a lively passion this task of alleviating your pains or of diminishing their number is the only one i would fulfil at this moment in disorders without remedy it is to the regimen alone that advice can be applied the only thing i ask of you is to remember that to pity a sick person is not to blame him who are we pray that any of us should blame another let us leave the right to judge to him alone who reads in our hearts and i even dare believe that in his paternal sight a host of virtues may redeem a single weakness but i conjure you my dear friend guard yourself above all from those violent resolutions which are less a proof of strength than of entire discouragement do not forget that in rendering another possessor of your existence to employ your own expression it is not in your power to deprive your friends of the part of it which they previously possessed and will never cease to reclaim adieu my dear daughter think sometimes of your affectionate mother and believe that you will ever be and above all else the object of her dearest thoughts at the chateau de fourth november seventeen end of section twenty six section twenty seven of dangerous connections this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos, Section 27, Letters 131 to 135. Letter the 131st. The Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont. "'Tis well done, Vicomte, and I am better pleased with you this time than the last, but now let us talk in all friendship, and I hope to convince you that, for you as for myself, the arrangement which you appear to desire would be a veritable piece of madness. Have you not yet remarked that pleasure, which is, in effect, the sole motive of the union of the two sexes, does not nevertheless suffice to form a liaison between them and that if it is preceded by the desire which attracts it is no less followed by the disgust which repels tis a law of nature which love alone can change and love does one have it when one wills yet one needs it ever and it would be really too embarrassing if one had not discovered that it happily suffices if it exists only in one side the difficulty has thus been rendered less by one half even without much being lost thereby in fact the one derives pleasure from the happiness of loving the other from that of pleasing which is a little less keen indeed but to which is added the pleasure of deceiving that sets up an equilibrium and everything is arranged but tell me vicomte which of us two will undertake to deceive the other you know the story of the two sharpers who recognized each other while playing 
we shall make nothing said they let us divide the cost of the cards and they gave up the game we had best follow believe me their prudent example and not lose time together which we can so well employ elsewhere to prove to you that in this i am influenced as much by your interests as my own and that i am acting neither from ill-humour nor caprice i do not refuse you the price agreed upon between us i feel perfectly that each of us will suffice to the other for one night and i do not even doubt but that we should know too well how to adorn it not to see the end with regret but do not let us forget that this regret is necessary to happiness and however sweet be our illusion let us not believe that it can be lasting you see that i am meeting you in my turn and even before you have yet set yourself right with me for after all i was to have the first letter of the celestial prude however whether because you still cling to it or because you have forgotten the conditions of a bargain which interests you perhaps less than you would fain have me believe i have received nothing absolutely nothing yet unless i make a mistake the tender puritan must write frequently else what would she do when she is alone surely she has not wit enough to distract herself i could have then did i wish some slight reproaches to make you but i passed them over in silence in consideration of a little temper that i showed perhaps in my last letter now vicomte it only remains for me to make one request of you and this is again as much for your sake as my own it is to postpone a moment which i desire perhaps as much as you but the date of which must i think be deferred until my return to town on the one hand we should not find the necessary freedom here and on the other i should incur some risk for it needs but a little jealousy to attach this tedious belleroche more closely than ever to my side although he now only holds by a thread he is already driven to exert himself in order to love me to such a degree at present that i put as much malice as prudence into the caresses which i lavish on him but at the same time you can see that this would not be a sacrifice to make to you a reciprocal infidelity will render the charm far more potent do you know i regret sometimes that we are reduced to these resources in the days when we loved for i believe it was love i was happy and you vicomte but why be longer concerned with a happiness which cannot return nay say what you will such a return is impossible first i should require sacrifices which assuredly you could not or would not make and which like enough i do not deserve and then how is it possible to fix you oh no no i will not even occupy myself with the idea and in spite of the pleasure which i derive at the present moment from writing to you i far prefer to leave you abruptly adieu vicomte at the chateau de six of november seventeen Letter the hundred and thirty second, the Presidente de Tourvel to Madame de Rosemonde. Deeply touched, Madame, with your kindness to me, I would abandon myself entirely to it, were I not prevented in some sort from accepting it by the fear of profaning it. Why must it be that, while I see it to be so precious, I feel at the same time that I am no longer worthy of it? Ah, I will at least venture to express to you my gratitude. I will admire above all that indulgent virtue which only knows our frailties to compassionate them, and whose potent charm preserves so soft and strong an empire over hearts, even by the side of the charm of love. But can I still deserve a friendship which no longer suffices for my happiness? I say the same of your counsels. I feel their worth, but I cannot follow them. And how should I not believe in a perfect happiness when I experience it at this moment? 
Yes, if men are such as you say, we ought to shun them. But then Valmont is so far from resembling them. If, like them, he has that violence of passion which you call ardour, how far it is surpassed by his delicacy! Oh, my friend, you talk of sharing my troubles. Take a part, then, in my happiness. I owe it to love, and how greatly does the object enhance its value. You love your nephew, you say, perhaps foolishly. Ah, oh, if you did but know him as I do! I love him with idolatry, and even so far less than he deserves. He may, doubtless, have been led astray by certain errors. He admits it himself. But who ever knew true love as he does? What more can I say to you? He feels it as he inspires it. You will think that this is one of those chimerical ideas with which love never fails to abuse our imagination. But in that case why should he have become more tender, more ardent, when he has nothing further to obtain? I will confess, before, I found in him an air of reflection, of reserve which rarely abandoned him, and which often reminded me, in spite of myself, of the cruel and false impressions which had been given me of him. But since he has been able to abandon himself without constraint to the movements of his heart, he seems to guess all the desires of mine. Who knows if we were not born for each other? that this happiness was not reserved for me, of being necessary to his. Ah, oh, if it is an illusion, let me die, then, before it comes to an end. But no, I am fain to live, to cherish, to adore him. Why should he cease to love me? What other woman could he render happier than me? And I feel from my own experience that the happiness one arouses is the strongest tie, the only one which really attaches. Yes, it is this delicious sentiment which ennobles love, which purifies it in some sort, and makes it worthy of a tender and generous soul, such as Valmont's. Adieu, my dear, my venerable, my indulgent friend! It is in vain that I should write to you at greater length. Here is the hour at which he has promised to come. Forgive me. But you wish me happiness, and at this moment it is so great that I can scarcely support it. Paris, 7th November, 17, blank. Letter the 133rd, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. Oh, what then, my lovely friend, are those sacrifices which you deem I would not make for you, the reward of which, however, would be to please you? let me only know them and if i hesitate to offer them to you i permit you to refuse the homage pray what opinion have you conceived of me of late if even in your indulgence you doubt my sentiments or my energy sacrifices which i would not or could not make you think then that i am in love and subjugated and you suspect me of having attached to the person the price which i set upon success oh thank heaven i am not yet reduced to that and i offer to prove it to you yes i will prove it to you even if it should be at madame de tourvel's expense after that assuredly you can have no further doubt i have been able without compromising myself to devote some time to a woman who has at least the merit of being of a sort that is rarely met with perhaps moreover the dead season at which this adventure befell caused me to abandon myself more to it and even now when the great current has scarcely begun to flow it is not surprising that it should almost entirely occupy me but remember please that it is scarce eight days since i culled the fruits of three months labour i have often dallied longer with what was of much less value and had not cost me so much and never did you draw a conclusion from it to my prejudice besides 
would you like to know the true cause of the zeal i am bringing to bear upon it hm, i will tell you this woman is naturally timid at first she doubted incessantly of her happiness and this doubt sufficed to trouble it so much so that i am only just beginning to see the extent of my power in this direction yet it was a thing i was curious to know and the occasion is not so readily offered as you may think to begin with for many women pleasure is always pleasure and never aught else and in the sight of these whatever the title with which they adorn us we are never more than factors mere commissioners whose activity is all our merit and amongst whom he who does the most is always he who does best in another class perhaps nowadays the most numerous the celebrity of the lover the pleasure of having carried him off from a rival the fear of being robbed of him in turn absorb the women almost entirely we count indeed more or less for something in the kind of enjoyment they obtain but it depends more on the circumstances than on the person it comes to them through us and not from us i needed then for the purposes of my observation to find a delicate and sensitive woman who made love her sole affair and who in love itself saw only her lover whose emotions far from following the common road ever started from the heart to reach the senses whom i have seen for instance and i do not speak of the first day rise from the moment of enjoyment in despair and a moment later recover pleasure in a word which was responsive to her soul last she must unite to all this that natural candour grown insurmountable by force of habit which would not permit her to dissimulate the least sentiment of her heart now you will admit such women are rare and i dare believe that failing this one i should never perhaps have met another it should not be surprising therefore that she should hold me longer than another and if the trouble that i take with her makes her happy perfectly happy why should i refuse it especially as it pleases me instead of being disagreeable to me but because the mind is engaged does it follow that the heart is caught certainly not nor will the value which i admit i set upon this adventure prevent me from embarking on others or even from sacrificing it to some more agreeable one i am free to such an extent that i have not even neglected the little volange whom nevertheless i hold so cheap her mother brings her back to town in three days and yesterday i assured my communications a little money to the porter a few compliments to his wife did the business can you conceive that danceny never thought of this simple method and then they tell us that love creates ingenuity <laughs> on the contrary it stupefies those whom it enslaves shall not i then know how to defend myself from it ah you may be easy already in a few days i am about to weaken the impression too lively perhaps which i have experienced by dividing it 
and if a simple division will not do i will multiply them <laughs> i shall none the less be ready to restore the little schoolgirl to her discreet lover as soon as you think proper it seems to me that you have no longer any motive for preventing it and i consent to do poor danceny this signal service it is in truth the least i can do in return for those he has done me he is at present in the greatest anxiety to discover whether he will be received at madame de volanges i calm him to the utmost of my power by assuring him that i will contrive his happiness on an early occasion and in the meantime i continue to charge myself with the correspondence which he means to resume on the arrival of his cecile i have already six letters from him and i shall certainly have one or two more before the happy day the lad must have mighty little to do <laughs> but let us leave this childish couple and return to ourselves so that i may occupy myself exclusively with the sweet hope your letter gave me yes without a doubt you will hold me and i would not pardon you for doubting it pray have i ever ceased to be constant to you our bonds have been relaxed but never broken our pretended rupture was only an error of our imagination our sentiments our interests remained none the less united like the traveller who returns in disillusion i will confess that i deserted happiness to run after hope and will say with d'arcourt the more strange lands i saw i loved my country more note plus je vis d'étrangers plus j'aimais ma patrie du belois tragedy of le siège de calais please then oppose no longer the idea or rather the sentiment which restores you to me and after having tasted all the pleasures in our different courses let us enjoy the happiness of feeling that none of them is comparable with that which we had of old and which we shall find more delicious still adieu my charming friend i consent to await your return but hasten it i pray you and do not forget how greatly i desire it paris eighth november seventeen letter the hundred and thirty fourth the marquise de merteuil to the vicomte de valmont truly vicomte you are like the children before whom one cannot say a word and to whom one can show nothing because they would at once lay hold of it a bare idea which comes to me upon which i warned you even that i was not settled because i speak of it to you you take advantage of it to recall my attention to it when i am seeking to forget it and to make me in a measure participate in spite of myself in your headstrong desires is it generous pray to leave me to support the whole burden of prudence alone I tell you again, and repeat it more often to myself, the arrangement which you suggest is really impossible. Even if you were to include all the generosity you display at this moment, do you suppose that I have not my delicacy also, or that I should be ready to accept sacrifices which would be harmful to your happiness? now is it not true vicomte that you are under an illusion as to the sentiment which attaches you to madame de tourvel it is love or love has never existed 
You deny it in a hundred fashions, but you prove it in a thousand. What, for instance, of that subterfuge you employ towards myself, for I believe you to be sincere with me, which makes you ascribe to curiosity the desire which you can neither conceal nor overcome of retaining this woman? Would not one say that you had never made any other woman happy, perfectly happy? Ah, uh, if you doubt that, you have but a poor memory. Nay, it is not that. Quite simply, your heart imposes on your intelligence, and is rewarded with bad arguments. But I, who have great interest in not being deceived by them, am not so easily satisfied. Thus, while remarking your politeness, which has made you rigorously suppress all the words which you imagined had displeased me, I saw, nevertheless, that, perhaps without taking notice of it, you nonetheless retained the same ideas. Tis true, it is no longer the adorable, the celestial Madame de Tourvelle, but it is an astounding woman, a delicate and sensitive woman, even to the exclusion of all others, in short, a rare woman, and such that you would never have met another. It is the same with that unknown charm which is not the strongest. Well, so be it, but since you had never found it before, it is easy to believe that you would be no more likely to find it in the future, and the loss you would incur would be none the less irreparable. Either these are certain symptoms of love, Vicomte, or we must renounce all hope of ever finding any. Rest assured that this time I am speaking to you without temper. I have promised I will no more indulge in it. I recognized too clearly that it might become a dangerous snare. Believe me, let us be no more than friends, and let us be content with that. Only do justice to my courage in defending myself. Yes, my courage, for one has sometimes need of it, if it be only to refrain from taking a course which one feels to be a bad one. It is only, then, in order to bring you to my opinion by persuasion that I am going to answer the question you put as to the sacrifices which I should exact, and which you could not make. I employ the word exact expressly, for I am very sure that, in a moment, you will, indeed, find me over-exacting. So much the better." Far from being annoyed at your refusal, I shall thank you for it. Come, it is not with you that I care to dissimulate, although perhaps I had need do so. I would exact, then, observe my cruelty, that this rare, this astounding Madame de Tourvelle should become no more to you than an ordinary woman, merely a woman such as she is, for you must not deceive yourself. The charm which you think to find in others exists in us, and it is love alone which so embellishes the beloved object. What I now require, impossible as it may be, you would, perhaps, make a grand effort to promise me, to swear it even, but I confess I should put no faith in empty words. I could only be convinced by the whole tenor of your conduct. Nor is that even all. I should be capricious. The sacrifice of the little Cecile, which you offer me with so good a grace, I should not care about at all. I should ask you, on the contrary, to continue this troublesome service until fresh orders on my part, whether because I should like thus to abuse my empire, or that, more indulgent or more just, it would suffice me to dispose of your feelings without wishing to thwart your pleasures. Be that as it may, I would fain be obeyed, and my orders would be very rigorous. "'Tis true that then I should think myself obliged to thank you, and, who knows, perhaps even to reward you. For instance, I should assuredly shorten an absence which would become insupportable to me. In short, I should see you again, Vicomte, and I should see you—how?' 
but you must remember this is no more than a conversation a plain narrative of an impossible project and i would not be the only one to forget it do you know that my lawsuit makes me a little uneasy i wanted at last to know exactly what my prospects were my advocates indeed quote me sundry laws and above all many authorities as they call them but i cannot see so much reason and justice in them i am almost inclined to regret that i declined the compromise however i am reassured when i reflect that the attorney is skilful the advocate eloquent and the plaintiff pretty if these three arguments were to be of no more worth it would be necessary to change the whole course of affairs and what then would become of the respect for ancient customs this lawsuit is now the only thing which retains me here that of belleroche is finished non suited costs divided he is regretting this evening's ball it is indeed the regret of the unemployed i will restore him his complete liberty on my return to town i make this grievous sacrifice for him but am consoled by the generosity he finds in it adieu vicomte write to me often the particulars of your pleasures will recompense me at least in part for the tedium i undergo at the chateau de eleventh november seventeen Letter the hundred and thirty fifth The Presidente de Tourvel to Madame de Rosemonde. I am endeavouring to write to you without yet knowing if I shall be able. Oh, God! When I think of my last letter, which my excessive happiness prevented me from continuing, it is the thought of my despair which overwhelms me now, which leaves me only strength enough to feel my sorrows and deprives me of the power of expressing them. Valmont. Valmont no longer loves me. He has never loved me. Love does not vanish thus. He deceives me, betrays me, outrages me. All misfortunes and humiliations that can be heaped together I experience, and it is from him that they come. Do not suppose that this is a mere suspicion. I was so far from having any. I have not even the consolation of a doubt. What could he say to justify himself? But what matters it to him? He will not even make the attempt. Unhappy wretch! What will thy reproaches and tears avail with him? He is far from thinking of thee. Tis true, then, that he has sacrificed me, exposed me even. And to who? A low creature. But what am I saying? Ah! Oh, I have even lost the right to despise her. She has been false to fewer duties. She is not so guilty as I. Oh, how bitter is the sorrow which is founded upon remorse! I feel my torments redouble. Adieu, my dear friend, however unworthy I may have made myself of your pity, you will still feel it for me, if you can form any idea of what I suffer. I have just read over my letter, and I perceive it can tell you nothing. I will try, then, to master up courage to relate the cruel incident. It was yesterday— for the first time since my return I was going to sup abroad. Valmont came to see me at five o'clock. Never had he seemed so fond. He gave me to understand that my project of going out vexed him, and you may judge that I soon formed that of remaining with him. However, two hours and a half later, and suddenly, his air and tone underwent a sensible change. I know not whether I had let fall something which may have displeased him, be that as it may, shortly afterwards he pretended to recollect some business which compelled him to leave me and went away, not without displaying a very lively regret, which seemed affectionate, and which I then believed to be sincere. Being left alone I judged it more proper not to excuse myself from my first engagement, since I was at liberty to fulfil it. I completed my toilette and entered my carriage. Unfortunately my coachman took me by way of the opera, and I was involved in the crowd of people leaving. Four yards in front of me and in the rank next to my own I perceived Valmont's carriage. My heart instantly palpitated, but it was not from fear, and my only idea was the desire that my carriage should go forward. Instead of that it was his own which was forced to retreat, and which came alongside of mine. I instantly advanced. 
What was my astonishment to find a courtesan at his side, one well known as such? I withdrew, as you may well believe, and I had already seen quite enough to wound my heart. But you would hardly believe that this same woman, apparently informed by an odious confidence, never quitted the window of the carriage, nor ceased to stare at me with peals of scandalous laughter. In the condition of prostration to which I was reduced I let myself nevertheless be driven to the house where I was to stop, but it was impossible for me to remain. I felt each instant on the point of swooning away, and above all I could not restrain my tears. On my return I wrote to M. de Valmont, and sent him my letter immediately. He was not at home. Wishing at any price to issue from this state of death, or to confirm it for ever, I sent again with orders to wait for him. But before midnight my servant returned, telling me that the coachman who was back had told him that his master would not be home that night. I thought this morning that I had nothing else to do than to ask him for the return of my letters, and beg him to visit me no more. I have indeed given orders to this effect, but doubtless they were superfluous. It is nearly noon. He has not yet presented himself and I have not received a word from him. Now, my dear friend, I have nothing further to add. You are informed of everything, and you know my heart. My sole hope is that I may not long afflict your tender friendship. Paris, 15th November, 17, blank. End of section 27《セクション28オフ・ダンジョロス・コネクションズ》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ダンジョロス・コネクションズ》by Pierre Coderlo de la Clou。セクション28、Letters 136 to 140。Letter the 136: The President de Tourvel to the Vicomte de Valmont。Doubtless, Monsieur. After what passed yesterday, you will not expect me to receive you again, nor doubtless are you at all desirous that I should. This note, therefore, is written less with the intention of begging you to come no more, than to request you to return the letters, which should never have existed, and which, if they may have interested you for a moment as proofs of the infatuation you had occasioned, can only be indifferent to you now that this is dissipated, and that they only express a sentiment which you have destroyed. I admit and confess that I am to blame for having shown in you a confidence of which so many before me have been victims. In that I accuse myself alone. But I believed at least that I had not deserved to be handed over by you to insult and contempt. I believed that in sacrificing all for you and losing for you alone my rights to my own and others' esteem, I could nevertheless expect to be judged by you not more severely than by the public, whose opinion still discriminates, by an immense interval, between the frail woman and the woman who is depraved. These wrongs, which would be wrongs in the case of anybody, are the only ones I shall mention. I shall be silent on those of love. Your heart would not understand mine. Adieu, monsieur. Paris, 15th November, 17, blank. Letter the 137th. The Vicomte de Valmont to the Présidente de Tourvel. This instant only, madame, has your letter been handed to me. I shuddered as I read it, and it has left me with barely the strength to reply to it what terrible idea then do you form of me oh, doubtless i have my faults and such faults as i shall never forgive myself all my life even were you to cover them with your indulgence but how far from my soul have those ever been with which you reproach me what i humiliate you degrade you when i respect you as much as i cherish you when i have never felt a moment of pride save when you judged me worthy of you 
you are deceived by appearances and i admit they may have seemed against me but did not your heart contain the wherewithal to contend against them and did it not rebel at the mere thought that it could have a cause of complaint against mine however you believed it so you not only judged me capable of this atrocious madness but you even feared you had exposed yourself to it through your bounty to me oh, if you consider yourself to such a degree degraded by your love i am myself then all that is vile in your eyes oppressed by the painful emotion which this idea causes me i am losing in repelling it the time i should employ in destroying it i will confess all i am restrained also by quite another consideration must i retrace facts which i would fain obliterate and fix your attention and my own upon a moment of error which i would fain redeem with the rest of my life the cause of which i cannot even now conceive and the memory of which must forever be my humiliation and my despair oh, if my self-accusation is to excite your anger you will not at any rate have to seek far for your revenge it will be sufficient to hand me over to my remorse however who would believe it the first cause of this incident is the supreme charm which i experience when i am by you it was this which caused me too long to forget important business which could not be postponed i left you too late and did not find the person of whom i was in search i hoped to meet him at the opera and my visit there was equally unsuccessful emilie whom i met there whom i had known in days when i was far from knowing you or love emilie was without her carriage and begged me to set her down at her house not a dozen yards away and to this i consented but it was just then that i met you and i felt immediately that you would be driven to hold me guilty the fear of displeasing or of grieving you is so potent with me that it was bound to be and indeed was speedily noticed i admit even that it induced me to try and persuade the girl not to show herself this precaution of delicacy was fatal to love accustomed like all those of her condition never to be certain of an empire ever usurped save by means of the abuse which they allow themselves to make of it Emilie was by no means willing to allow so splendid an occasion to slip the more she saw my embarrassment increase the more she affected to show herself and her mad merriment and i blush to think that you could for a moment have thought yourself its object was only caused by the cruel pain i experienced which itself was but due to my respect and love so far doubtless i am more unfortunate than guilty and those wrongs which would be wrongs in the case of anybody and the only ones you mention those wrongs being wiped away cannot be a cause of reproach to me <sighs> but tis in vain you pass over in silence those of love i shall not maintain a like silence concerning them i have too great an interest in breaking it 
in the confusion in which i am thrown by this unaccountable deviation it is not without extreme sorrow that i can bring myself to recall the memory of it penetrated with a sense of my failings i would consent to pay the penalty for them or i would wait for time my eternal tenderness and repentance to bring my pardon but how can i be silent when what is left for me to say concerns your delicacy do not think i seek a pretence to excuse or palliate my fault i confess my guilt but i do not confess i will never admit that this humiliating error can be looked upon as a fault in love nay what can there be in common between a surprise of the senses a moment's self-oblivion soon followed by shame and regret and a pure sentiment which can only be born in a delicate soul and sustained by esteem and of which finally happiness is the fruit <sighs> do not profane love thus above all fear to profane yourself by uniting in the same point of view things which can never be confounded leave vile and degraded women to dread a rivalry which they feel may be established in their own despite and to know the pangs of a jealousy as humiliating as it is cruel but do you turn away your eyes from objects which might sully their glance and pure as the divinity punish the offence without feeling it oh, oh, but what penalty will you impose on me that is more grievous than that which i undergo what can be compared to the regret at having displeased you the despair at having grieved you the overwhelming idea of having rendered myself less worthy of you you are absorbed in punishing me and i ask you for consolations not that i deserve them but because they are necessary to me and they can only come to me from you if on a sudden forgetful of our love and setting no further price on my happiness you wish on the contrary to hand me over to eternal sorrow you have the right strike but if more indulgent or more sensitive you remind yourself once more of those tender sentiments which united our hearts of that voluptuousness of the soul always being born again and always felt more keenly of those sweet and fortunate days which each of us owed to the other all those benefits of love which love alone procures perhaps you will prefer the power of renewing to that of destroying them what can i say more i have lost all and lost it by my fault but i can retrieve all by your bounty it is for you to decide now i will add but one word only yesterday you swore to me that my happiness was quite secure so long as it depended on you oh, madame will you abandon me to-day to an eternal despair paris fifteenth november seventeen letter the hundred and thirty eighth the vicomte de valmont 
to the Marquise de Merteuil. I insist, my charming friend, no, I am not in love, and it is not my fault if circumstances force me to play the part. Only consent and return. You shall soon see for yourself how sincere I am. I made proof of it yesterday, and it cannot be destroyed by what occurs to-day. Know then I was with the tender prude, and was quite without any other business, for the little Volange, in spite of her condition, was to pass the whole night at Madame V.'s infant's ball. My lack of employment had at first inclined me to prolong the evening, and I had even demanded a slight sacrifice with this view, but hardly was it granted when the pleasure I had promised myself was disturbed by the idea of this love which you persist in ascribing to me, or at least in reproaching me with so much so that i felt no other desire except that of being able to assure myself and convince you that it was pure calumny on your part i made a violent resolve therefore and under some trivial pretext left my fair much surprised and doubtless even more grieved for myself i went tranquilly to meet emilie at the opera and she could testify to you that until this morning when we separated no regret came to trouble our pleasures i had however fine cause enough for uneasiness had not my utter indifference saved me from it for you must know that I was hardly four doors away from the opera, with Emilie in my carriage, when that of the austere Puritan drew up exactly beside mine, and a block which occurred left us for nearly half a quarter of an hour side by side. We could see each other as clearly as at noon, and there was no means of escape nor is this all i took it into my head to confide to emilie that it was the woman of the letter you will remember perhaps that piece of folly and that emilie was the desk <laughs> note letters the forty sixth and forty seventh she had not forgotten it and as she is a laughter-loving creature she could not be at peace until she had examined at her ease this piece of virtue as she said and this with peals of such scandalous laughter as would have angered any one <sighs> still this is not all the jealous woman sent to my house the very same night i was not there but in her obstinacy she sent a second time with orders to wait for me as soon as i had made up my mind to sleep with emilie i had sent back my carriage with no other order to the coachman but to return and fetch me this morning and as on reaching home he found the messenger of love he told him very simply that i should not be back that night you can well imagine the effect of this news and that on my return i found my dismissal announced with all the dignity proper to the occasion thus this adventure which in your view was never to be determined could have been finished as you see this morning if it is not finished that is not as you will believe because i set any price on its continuation it is first because i did not think it decent that i should let myself be quitted 
and again because i wished to reserve for you the honour of the sacrifice i answered this severe note therefore in a long letter full of sentiment i gave lengthy reasons and relied on love to make them acceptable i have already succeeded i have just received a second note still very rigorous and confirming the eternal rupture as it ought to be the tone of it however is not the same above all i am not to be seen again this resolution is announced four times in the most irrevocable fashion i concluded thereby that i was not to lose a moment before i presented myself i have already sent my chasseur to win over the porter and in an instant i shall go myself to have my pardon sealed for in sins of this nature there is only one formula which carries a general absolution and that can only be performed at an audience adieu my charming friend i fly to make trial of this great event paris fifteenth november seventeen letter the hundred and thirty ninth the president de tourvel to madame de rosemonde how i reproach myself my tender friend for having spoken to you too much and too soon of my passing sorrows i am the cause if you are grieved at present those sorrows which you derive from me still endure and i i am happy yes all is forgotten pardoned rather let me say all is redeemed peace and delight have succeeded to this state of sorrow and anguish o oh, joy of my heart how can i express you valmont is innocent no one is guilty who loves so well those serious offensive wrongs for which i reproached him with so much bitterness he had not committed and if on a certain point my indulgence was necessary had i not also my injustice to repair i will not enter into the details of the facts or reasons which justify him perhaps even the mind would but ill appreciate them it is the heart alone which is capable of feeling them if however you were to suspect me of weakness i would summon your judgment to the aid of my own with men you have said yourself infidelity is not inconstancy tis not that i do not feel that this distinction which opinion justifies in vain none the less wounds our delicacy but of what should mine complain when that of valmont suffers even more for the very wrong which i forget do not believe that he forgives himself or is consoled and yet how greatly has he retrieved this trivial error by the excess of his love and my happiness either my felicity is greater or i know the value of it better since i have been afraid that i had lost it but what i may tell you is that if i felt i had sufficient strength to support again sorrows as cruel as those i have just undergone i should not deem i paid too high a price for the excess of happiness i have tasted since oh my tender mother scold your inconsiderate daughter for having grieved you by too much hastiness scold her for having judged rashly and calumniated him whom she should ever adore but whilst recognizing her imprudence see her happy and enhance her joy by sharing it paris fifteenth november seventeen blank letter the hundred and fortieth the vicomte de valmont to the marquise de merteuil how comes it my lovely friend that i receive no reply from you yet my last letter seemed to me to deserve one these three days i could have received it and i am awaiting it still i indeed i am vexed i shall not speak to you at all therefore of my grand affairs that the reconciliation had its full effect that instead of reproaches and distrust it but called forth fresh proofs of fondness 
that it is i at present who receive the excuses and reparation due to my suspected candour i shall tell you no word of this and but for the unexpected occurrence of last night i should not write to you at all but as that concerns your pupil who will probably not be in a condition to tell you of it herself at any rate for some time to come i have charged myself with the task for reasons which you may or may not guess madame de tourvel has not engaged my attention for some days past and as these reasons could not exist in the case of the little volange i became more attentive to her thanks to the obliging porter i had no obstacles to overcome and we led your pupil and i a comfortable and regular life but habit leads to negligence during the first days we could never take precautions enough for our safety we trembled even behind the bolts yesterday an incredible piece of forgetfulness caused the accident of which i have to inform you and if for my part i escaped with a fright it has cost the little girl considerably more we were not asleep but were in that state of repose and abandonment which succeeds to pleasure when we heard on a sudden the door of the room open i at once seized my sword as much for my own defence as for that of our common pupil i advanced and saw no one but indeed the door was open as we had a light i made a search but found no living soul i remembered then that we had forgotten our ordinary precautions and no doubt the door which had been only pushed to or badly shut had opened of itself on rejoining my timid companion with a view to calming her i no longer found her in the bed she had fallen or hidden herself betwixt the bed and wall she was stretched there without consciousness with no other movements than violent convulsions you may imagine my embarrassment i succeeded however in pulling her back in the bed and even in bringing her to but she had hurt herself in the fall and it was not long before she felt the effects pains in the loins violent colic pains symptoms even less ambiguous had soon enlightened me as to her condition but to acquaint her with it i had first to tell her of that in which she was before <laughs> for she had no suspicion of it never perhaps before her did any one preserve so much innocence after doing so well all that is necessary to get rid of it oh this one loses no time in reflection but she lost a great deal in bewailing herself and i felt it was time to come to a resolution i agreed with her then that i would go at once to the physician and to the surgeon of the family and informing them they would be sent for would confide the whole truth to them under a promise of secrecy that she on her side should ring for her waiting-maid that she should or should not take her into her confidence as she liked but that she should send her to seek assistance and forbid her above all to awake madame de volange a natural and delicate attention on the part of a daughter who fears to cause her mother anxiety oh, i made my two visits and my two confessions with what speed i could and thence returned home 
nor have i gone abroad since but the surgeon whom i knew before came at noon to give me an account of his patient's condition i was not mistaken but he hopes that if no accident occurs nothing will be noticed in the house the maid is in the secret the physician has given the complaint a name and this business will be settled like a thousand others unless it be useful for us to speak of it hereafter but have we still any interests in common you and i your silence would lead me to doubt it i should not even believe it at all did not my desire lead me to seek every means of preserving the hope of it adieu my lovely friend i embrace you though i bear you a grudge paris twenty first november seventeen end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of dangerous connections this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Codello de la Clos, Section 29, Letters 141 to 145. Letter the 141st, The Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont. Good God, Vicomte, how you trouble me with your obstinacy! What does my silence matter to you? Do you suppose, if I maintain it, that it is for lack of reasons to justify it? Ah, oh, would to God it were! But no, it is only that it is painful for me to tell you them. Tell me truly, are you under an illusion yourself, or are you trying to deceive me? The disparity between what you say and what you do leaves me no choice between these two sentiments— which is the true one? Pray, what would you have me say to you when I myself do not know what you think? You appear to make a great merit of your last scene with the Présidente, but pray, what does it prove for your system, or against mine? I certainly never said that you loved this woman well enough not to deceive her, or not to seize every occasion which might seem to you easy or agreeable— I never even doubted but that it would be very much the same to you to satisfy with another, with the first comer, the same desires which she alone could have raised. And I am not surprised that, in the licentiousness of mind which one would be wrong to deny you, you have done once from deliberation what you have done a thousand times from opportunity." Who does not know that this is the simple way of the world, and the custom of you all, whoever you are, to whatever class you belong, from the rascal to the espèce? Whoever abstains from it nowadays passes for a romantic, and that is not, I think, the fault with which I reproach you. But what I have said, what I have thought, and what I still think, is that you are none the less in love with your Présidente. Truly not with a love that is very pure or very tender, but with that of which you are capable, that kind, for instance, which enables you to find in a woman attractions or qualities which she does not possess, which places her in a class apart and puts all other women in the second rank, which keeps you attached to her even when you outrage her, such, in short, as I conceive a sultan may feel for a favourite sultana, which does not prevent him from preferring to her often a simple odalisk. My comparison seems to me all the more just because, like him, you are never either the lover or friend of a woman, but always her tyrant or her slave. Thus I am quite sure you humbled and abased yourself mightily to regain this lovely creature's good graces. 
and only too happy at having succeeded, as soon as you think the moment has arrived to obtain your pardon, you leave me for this grand event. In your last letter, again, if you do not speak exclusively of this woman, it is because you will not tell me anything of your grand affairs. They seem to you so important that the silence which you maintain on this subject seems to you sufficient punishment for me. And it is after these thousand proofs of your decided preference for another that you ask me, calmly, whether we still have any in common. Take care, Vicomte. If I once answer you, my answer will be irrevocable, and to be afraid to give it at this moment is perhaps already to have said too much. I am resolved, therefore, to speak no more of it. All that I can do is to tell you a story. Maybe you will not have time to read it or to give so much attention to it as to understand it, right? That is your affair. At worst, it will only be a story wasted. A man of my acquaintance was entangled, like you, with a woman who did him little honour. He had indeed, at intervals, the wit to feel that, sooner or later, this adventure would do him harm, but although he blushed for it, he had not the courage to break it off. His embarrassment was all the greater in that he had boasted to his friends that he was entirely free, and that he was well aware that, when one meets with ridicule, it is always increased by self-defence. He passed his life thus, never ceasing to commit follies, never ceasing to say afterwards, "'It is not my fault!' This man had a friend, and she was tempted at one moment to give him up to the public in this state of frenzy, and thus render his ridicule indelible. However, being more generous than malicious, or perhaps for some other motive, she wished to make one last attempt, so that, whatever happened, she might be in a position to say, like her friend, "'It is not my fault.' She sent him, therefore, without any other explanation, the following letter, as a remedy whose application might be useful to his disease. One tires of everything, my angel. It is a law of nature. It is not my fault. If, then, I am tired today of an adventure which has occupied me exclusively for four mortal months, it is not my fault. If, for instance, I had just as much love as you had virtue, and that is saying much, it is not surprising that one should finish at the same time as the other. It is not my fault. Hence it follows that for some time past I have deceived you, but then your pitiless fondness in some measure forced me to it. It is not my fault. Today a woman whom I love to distraction demands that I sacrifice you. It is not my fault. I am very sensible that here is a fine opportunity for calling me perjured, but if nature has only gifted men with constancy whilst it has given women obstinacy, it is not my fault. Believe me, take another lover as I have taken another mistress. This advice is good, very good. If you think it bad, it is not my fault. Adieu, my angel. I took you with pleasure. I leave you without regret. Perhaps I shall return. This is the way of the world. It is not my fault. It is not the moment, Vicomte, to tell you the effect of this last attempt and what resulted from it, but uh, I promise to let you know in my next letter. You will find there also my ultimatum as to the renewal of the treaty you propose. Until then, quite simply, adieu. By the way, I thank you for your details as to the little Volange. It is an article that will keep for the Gazette of Scandal on the day after her marriage. In the meantime, I send you my condolences on the loss of your progeny. Good night, Vicomte. 
at the Chateau de 24th of November, 17. Letter the 142nd, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. Upon my word, my lovely friend, I know not whether I have misread or misunderstood your letter, and the story you told me, and the model a little epistle which it contained. All I can tell you is that this last seemed to me original and calculated to produce an effect so that i simply copied it and quite simply again sent it to the celestial presidente i did not lose a moment for the tender missive was dispatched yesterday evening i preferred it thus because first i had promised to write to her yesterday and again because i thought a whole night would not be too long for her to reflect and meditate upon this grand event even though you should reproach me a second time with the expression i hoped to be able to send you my beloved's reply this morning but it is nearly noon and i have as yet received nothing I shall wait until five o'clock, and if then I have no news of her, I shall go and inquire myself. For in matters of form, above all, it is only the first step that is difficult. At present, as you may well believe, I am most anxious to hear the end of the story of this man of your acquaintance so vehemently suspected of not knowing at need how to sacrifice a woman did he not amend and did not his generous friend give him her pardon i am no less anxious to receive your ultimatum as you so politically say I am curious, above all, to know if you will find love again in this last proceeding. Oh, no doubt there is, and much of it, but for whom? Still, I make no pretensions, and I expect everything from your charity. Adieu, my charming friend. I shall not seal this letter until two o'clock, in the hope of being able to enclose the expected reply. At two o'clock in the afternoon. Still nothing. I am in a mighty hurry. I have not time to add a word. But this time, will you still refuse the tenderest kisses of love? Paris, 25th November, 17. Letter the 143rd. The President de Tourvel to Madame de Rosemonde. The veil is rent, madame, upon which was painted the illusion of my happiness. Grim truth enlightens me, and shows me naught but a sure and speedy death, the road to which is traced between shame and remorse. I will follow it. I will cherish my torments, if they cut short my existence. I will send you the letter which I received yesterday. I will add no reflections on it. It contains them all. The time has passed for complaint. Nothing is left but to suffer. It is not pity I need, but strength. Receive, madame, the one farewell that I shall utter, and grant me my last prayer. It is to leave me to my fate, to forget me utterly, to consider me no longer upon the earth. There is a stage of misery in which even friendship augments our sufferings and cannot heal them. When wounds are mortal, all succour becomes inhuman. All emotion is foreign to me save that of despair. Nothing can befit me now save the profound darkness in which I will bury my shame. There I will weep over my faults, if I can still weep for since yesterday I have not shed a tear. My withered heart no longer furnishes any. Adieu, madame. 
do not answer me. I have made a vow upon that cruel letter never to receive another. Paris, 27th November, 17, blank. Letter the 144th, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. <sighs> Yesterday, at three o'clock in the evening, my lovely friend, being out of patience at having received no news, I presented myself at the house of the deserted fair. I was told that she was out. I saw nothing more in this phrase than a refusal to receive me, at which I was neither vexed nor surprised, and I retired in the hope that this step would induce so polite a woman to honour me with at least a word of reply. The desire I had to receive it brought me home on purpose about nine o'clock, but I found nothing there astonished at this silence for which i was not prepared i sent my chasseur for information and to discover if the sensitive person was dying or dead at last when i had returned he informed me that madame de tourvel had indeed gone out at eleven in the forenoon with her waiting-maid that she was driven to the convent of and that at seven o'clock in the evening she sent back her carriage and servants saying that they were not to expect her home hmm. this is certainly acting according to rule the convent is the widow's right asylum and if she persists in so laudable a resolution i shall add to all the other obligations which i owe her that of the celebrity which this adventure will assume i told you some time ago that in spite of your uneasiness i should only reappear upon the stage of the world brilliant with new eclat let them show themselves then these severe critics who accused me of a romantic and unhappy passion let them make quicker or more brilliant ruptures nay let them do better let them present themselves as consolers the way is clear for them <laughs> well let them only dare to attempt the course which i have run from end to end and if one of them obtains the least success i yield him the place of honour but they will all discover that when i am at any pains the impression i leave is ineffaceable this one i am sure will be so and I look upon all my other triumphs as nothing, if in this case I was ever to have a favoured rival. The course she has taken flatters my self-love, I admit, but I am annoyed that she should have found sufficient strength to separate herself so much from me. There will be no obstacles between us, then, save those of my own formation. Hmm, what, if I wished to renew with her, she might be unwilling? Oh, what am I saying? She would not desire it, deem it no more her supreme happiness. Is it thus that one loves? and do you think my lovely friend that i ought to suffer it could i not for instance and would it not be better endeavour to bring this woman to the point of seeing the possibility of a reconciliation which one always desires as long as one has hope <sighs> i could try this course without attaching any importance to it and consequently without your taking umbrage on the contrary it would be a simple experiment which we would perform in concert 
and even if i should succeed it would but be one means the more of repeating when you wished it a sacrifice which seems to have been agreeable to you now my fair one i am waiting to receive the reward and all my prayers offer your return come quickly then to recover your lover your pleasures your friends and the current of adventure <sighs> that of the little volange has turned out amazing well yesterday my uneasiness not allowing me to remain in one place i called amongst my various excursions upon madame de volange i found your pupil already in the salon still in the costume of an invalid but in full convalescence looking only fresher and more interesting <laughs> you women in a like situation would have lain a month on your long chair my faith long live our demoiselle ah this one in truth gave me a desire to see if the recovery was a complete one i have still to tell you that the little girl's accident had like to have turned your sentimental dancenese head at first it was grief to-day it is joy his cecile was ill you can imagine how the brain reels at such a calamity three times a day he sent to inquire after her and on no occasion omitted to present himself finally in a noble epistle he asked mamma's permission to go and congratulate her on the convalescence of so dear an object and madame de volange consented so much so that i found the young man established as in the old days save for a certain familiarity which as yet he dares not permit himself it is from himself that i have learned these details for i left at the same time with him and made him chatter you can have no notion of the effect this visit has had on him joy desires transports impossible to describe i with my fondness for grand emotions completed the work of turning his head by assuring him that in a very few days i would put him in the way of seeing his fair one at closer quarters indeed i am determined to hand her over to him as soon as i have made my experiment i wish to consecrate myself to you wholly and then would it be worth while that your pupil should also be my scholar if she were to deceive nobody but her husband <laughs> the masterpiece is to deceive her lover and above all her first lover as for myself i have not to reproach myself with having uttered the word love adieu my lovely friend return soon then to enjoy your empire over me to receive its homage and to pay me its reward paris twenty eighth november seventeen Letter of the hundred and forty fifth the Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont Seriously, Vicomte, have you left the Presidente? Have you sent her the letter which I wrote you for her? Really, you are charming, and you have surpassed my expectations. In all good faith I confess that this triumph gratifies me more than all those I have hitherto obtained. You will think, perhaps, that I set a very high value on this woman, whom recently I so disparaged. 
not at all but it is not over her that i have gained the advantage it is over you that is the amusing and really delicious part of it yes vicomte you loved madame de tourvel much and you love her still you are madly in love with her but because i amused myself by making you ashamed of it you bravely sacrificed her he would have sacrificed a thousand of her rather than submit to raillery to what lengths will not vanity carry us the wise man was right indeed when he said that it was the enemy of happiness where would you be now if i had only wished to play you a trick but i am incapable of deceit as you well know and should you even reduce me in my turn to the convent and despair i will run the risk and surrender to my victor if i capitulate however it is really mere frailty for if i liked what quibbles i might set up and perhaps you would deserve them i admire for instance the skill or the awkwardness with which you sweetly proposed to me that you should be allowed to renew with the presidente it would suit you mightily would it not to take all the merit of this rupture without losing thereby the pleasures of enjoyment and then as this apparent sacrifice would be no longer one for you you offer to repeat it when i wish it by this arrangement the celestial prude would always believe herself to be the single choice of your heart whilst i should plume myself on being the preferred rival we should both of us be deceived but you would be happy and what does the rest matter tis a pity that with such a genius for conceiving projects you should have so little for their execution and that by a single ill-considered step you should have yourself put an invincible obstacle to what you most desire what you had an idea of renewing and you could write my letter you must have thought me clumsy indeed ah believe me vicomte when one woman strikes at another's heart she rarely fails to find the vital spot and the wound is incurable when i was striking this one or rather guiding your blows i had not forgotten that the woman was my rival that you had for one moment preferred her to me and in short that you had rated me below her if my vengeance has been deceived i consent to bear the blame thus i am satisfied that you should try every means i even invite you to do so and promise you not to be vexed at your success if you should attain it i am so easy on the subject that i will trouble no further about it let us speak of something else for instance of the health of the little volange you will give me definite news of it on my return will you not i shall be very glad to have some after that it will be for you to judge whether it will suit you best to restore her to her lover or to endeavour to become once more the founder of a new branch of the valmonts under the name of gercourt this idea strikes me as rather diverting and in leaving you your choice i ask you not to take any definite step until we have talked of it together this does not delay you very long for i shall be in paris immediately i cannot tell you the precise day but you may be sure that you will be the first informed of my arrival adieu vicomte in spite of my peevishness my malice and my reproaches i have still much love for you and i am preparing to prove it to you au revoir my friend at the chateau de twenty ninth of november seventeen End of section 29。section 30 of dangerous connections。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos. Section 30, Letters 146 to 150. Letter the 146th, The Marquise de Merteuil to the Chevalier d'Anceny. At last I am leaving, my young friend, and tomorrow evening I shall be back again in Paris. In the midst of all the confusion which a change of residence involves, I shall receive no one. However, if you have some very pressing confidence to make me, I am quite willing to accept you from the general rule. I beg you, therefore, to keep the secret of my arrival. Valmont, even, will not be informed of it. Had any one told me a short time ago that soon you would have my exclusive confidence, I should not have believed it. But yours has attracted mine. I am tempted to believe that you have brought some skill to this end, perhaps even some seduction. That would be very wrong, to say the least. For the rest, it would not be dangerous now. You have really other and better occupations. When the heroine is on the scene, there is little notice taken of the confidant. Indeed, you have not even found time to acquaint me of your new successes. When your Cecile was absent, the days were not long enough to hear your tender complaints. You would have made them to the echoes if I had not been there to hear them. Since then, when she was ill, you honoured me again with the recital of your anxieties. You wanted someone to whom to tell them. But now that she whom you love is in Paris, that she is recovered, and, above all, that you sometimes see her, she is all-sufficing, and your friends see no more of you. I do not blame you, it is the fault of your twenty years. From Alcibiades down to yourself, do we not know that young people are unacquainted with friendship, save in their sorrows? Happiness sometimes makes them indiscreet, but never confiding. I am ready to say with Socrates, I love my friends to come to me when they are unhappy. Note, Marmontel, Conte Moral d'Alcibiade. But in his quality of a philosopher, he could dispense with them when they did not come. In that I show less wisdom than he, and I felt your silence with all a woman's weakness. Do not, however, think me exacting. I am far from being that. The same sentiment which makes me notice these privations enables me to support them with courage when they are the proof, or the cause, of my friend's happiness. I do not count on you, therefore, for tomorrow evening, save in so far as love may leave you free and disengaged, and I forbid you to make the least sacrifice for me. Adieu, Chevalier. It will be a real festival to see you again. Will you come? At the Chateau de... 29th of November, 17. Letter the 147th. Madame de Volanges to Madame de Rosemonde. I am sure you will be as grieved as I am, my worthy friend, to learn of the condition in which Madame de Tourvel lies. She has been ill since yesterday. Her disorder appeared so suddenly, and exhibits such grave symptoms, that I am really alarmed. A burning fever, a violent and almost constant delirium, an unquenchable thirst, that is all that can be remarked. The doctors say they can make no diagnosis as yet, and the treatment will be all the more difficult, because the patient refuses every kind of remedy with such obstinacy that it was necessary to hold her down by force to bleed her, and the same course had to be followed on two other occasions to tie up her bandage, which in her delirium she persists in tearing off. You who have seen her, as I have, so fragile, timid, and quiet, cannot conceive that four persons are barely enough to hold her, and at the slightest expostulation she flies into indescribable fury. For my part, I am afraid it is something worse than delirium, and that she is really gone out of her mind. What increases my fear on this subject is a thing which occurred the day before yesterday. Upon that day she arrived about eleven o'clock in the forenoon, with her waiting-maid, at the convent of... 
as she was educated in that house, and had continued the habit of sometimes visiting it, she was received as usual, and seemed to every one calm and in good health. About two hours later, she inquired if the room she had occupied as a schoolgirl was vacant, and, on being answered in the affirmative, she asked to go and see it. The prioress accompanied her with some other nuns. It was then that she declared that she had come back to take her abode in that room, which, said she, she ought never to have left, and which, she added, she would never leave until her death. Those were her words. At first they knew not what to say, but when their first astonishment was over, it was represented to her that her position as a married woman prevented them from receiving her without a special permission. Neither this, nor a thousand other reasons, made any impression. And from that moment she obstinately refused not only to leave the convent, but even her room. At last, weary of the discussion, they consented, at seven o'clock in the evening, that she should pass the night there. Her carriage and servants were dismissed, and they awaited the next day to come to some decision. I am assured that, all through the evening, her air and bearing, far from being wild, were composed and deliberate. Only that she fell four or five times into a reverie so deep that they could not rouse her from it by speaking to her, and that, each time before she issued from it, she carried her two hands to her brow, which she seemed to clasp vigorously, upon which one of the nuns who were with her, having asked her if her head pained her, she gazed at her a long time before replying, and said at last, The hurt is not there. A moment later she asked to be left alone, and begged that no further question should be put to her. Every one retired except her waiting-maid, who was fortunately obliged to sleep in the same chamber, for lack of other room. According to this girl's account, her mistress was pretty quiet until eleven o'clock. She then expressed a wish to go to bed, but, before she was quite undressed, she began to walk up and down her chamber, with much action and frequent gestures. Julie, who had been a witness of what had passed during the day, dared say not to her, and waited in silence for nearly an hour. At length Madame de Tourvel called to her twice in quick succession. She had but the time to run up when her mistress fell into her arms, saying, I am exhausted. She let herself be led to bed, and would not take anything, nor allow any help to be sent for. She merely had some water placed near her, and ordered Julie to lie down. The girl declares that she remained awake until two in the morning, and that, during that time, she heard neither a movement nor a complaint. But she says that she was awakened at five o'clock by the talk of her mistress, who was speaking in a loud and high voice, and that, having inquired if she needed anything, and obtaining no reply, she took the light and went to the bed of Madame de Tourvel, who did not recognize her, but suddenly interrupting her incoherent remarks, cried out excitedly, "'Leave me alone! Leave me in the darkness! It is the darkness that becomes me!' I remarked yesterday myself that she often repeats this phrase. At length Julie profited by this kind of order to go out and seek other assistance, but Madame de Tourvel refused it, with the fury and delirium which she has displayed so often since. The confusion into which these threw the whole convent induced the prioress to send for me at seven o'clock yesterday morning. It was not yet daylight. I hastened there at once. When my name was announced to Madame de Tourvel, she appeared to recover her consciousness, and replied, Oh, yes, let her come in. But when I reached her bed, she looked fixedly at me, took my hand excitedly, gripped it, and said in a loud but gloomy voice, I am dying because I did not believe you. Immediately afterwards, hiding her eyes, she returned to her most frequent remark, Leave me alone, etc., and lost all consciousness. This phrase and some others which fell from her in her delirium make me fear lest this cruel affliction may have a cause which is crueler still. But let us respect the secrets of our friend, and be content to pity her misfortune. The whole of yesterday was equally tempestuous, 
and was divided between fits of alarming delirium and moments of lethargic depression, the only ones when she takes or gives any rest. I did not leave her bedside until nine o'clock in the evening, and I shall return to it this morning to pass the day there. I will certainly not abandon my unfortunate friend, but the heart-rending part of it is her obstinacy in refusing all attention and succor. I send you the bulletin of last night, which I have just received, and which, as you will see, is anything but consoling. I will be careful to forward them all to you punctually. Adieu, my respected friend. I am going back to the patient. My daughter, who is fortunately almost recovered, sends you her respects. Paris, 29th of November, 1700 Letter the 148th, the Chevalier d'Ancenis to the Marquise de Merteuil. O oh, you whom I love, O oh, thou whom I adore, O oh, you who have commenced my happiness, O oh, thou who hast crowned it, compassionate friend, tender mistress, why must the recollection of thy sorrow come to trouble the charm which I undergo? Ah, madame, be calm, this friendship which implores you, O oh, my friend, be happy, tis the prayer of love. Nay, what reproaches have you to make to yourself? Believe me, you are misled by your delicacy. The regrets it causes you, the injuries of which it accuses me, are equally imaginary, and my heart feels that between us two there has been no other seducer but love. Dread no longer, then, to yield to the sentiments you inspire, to let yourself be penetrated by all the fires you yourself have kindled. What, would our hearts be less pure if they had been later illuminated? Doubtless, no. Tis seduction, on the contrary, which, acting never except by plan, can regulate its progress and its methods, and, from a distance, foresee events. But true love does not thus permit itself to meditate and reflect, it distracts us from our thoughts by our sentiments. Its sway is never stronger than when it is unknown, and it is in shadow and silence that it entangles us in bonds, which it is alike impossible to notice or to break. Thus, as late as yesterday, in spite of the lively emotion which the idea of your return caused me, in spite of the extreme pleasure I felt at seeing you, I nevertheless thought myself to be called and guided still by calm friendship only, or rather, abandoned wholly to the soft sentiments of my heart, I was very little concerned to unravel their origin or their cause. Like myself, my tender friend, you experienced, unconsciously, that imperious charm which handed over our souls to the sweet impressions of affection, and neither of us recognized love until we had issued from the intoxication in which the god had plunged us. But that very fact justifies, instead of condemning us, no, you have not been false to friendship, and I have not abused your confidence. It is true, we were both ignorant of our feelings, but we only underwent this illusion. We did not seek to give birth to it. Far from complaining of it, let us only think of the happiness it has procured us, and, without troubling it with unjust reproaches, let us only be concerned to enhance it by the charm of constancy and security, Oh, my friend, how my heart dotes on this hope. Yes, freed henceforward from every fear and given over wholly to love, you will participate in my desires, my transports, the delirium of my senses, the intoxication of my soul, and every moment of our fortunate days shall be marked by a new enjoyment. Adieu, thou whom I adore, I shall see thee this evening, but shall I find thee alone? I dare not hope it. Nay, you do not desire it as much as I do. Paris, 1st of December, in 17... Letter the 149th, Madame de Volanges to Madame de Rosemonde. I had hoped yesterday, almost all day, my revered friend, to be able to give you more favorable news this morning as to the health of our dear invalid. But this hope has been destroyed since last evening, and I am only left with the regret that I have lost it. An event, seemingly of scant importance, but cruel in the result it caused, has rendered the condition of our invalid at least as grievous as it was before, if, indeed, 
it has not made it worse. I should have understood no whit of this sudden change had I not received yesterday the complete confidence of our unhappy friend. As she did not conceal from me that you were also acquainted with all her misfortunes, I can speak to you, without reserve, of her sad situation. Yesterday morning, when I reached the convent, I was informed that the invalid had been asleep for the last three hours, and her slumber was so calm and deep that I was afraid for a moment that it was lethargic. Shortly afterwards she awoke and herself drew back the curtains of her bed. She gazed at us all with an air of surprise, and when I rose to go to her, she recognized me, spoke my name, and begged me to draw near. She left me no time to question her, but asked me where she was, what we were doing there, if she was sick, and why she was not at home. I thought at first that it was a new delirium, only of a more tranquil kind than the last, but I perceived that she fully understood my answers. In fact, she had recovered her reason, but not her memory. She questioned me very minutely as to all that had happened to her since she had been at the convent. With her she did not remember coming. I answered her correctly, only suppressing what might have given her too much alarm, and when I asked her, in my turn, how she felt, she replied that she was not in pain at that moment, but that she had suffered greatly in her sleep and felt tired. I persuaded her to be quiet and to talk little, after which I partly closed her curtains, leaving them half open, and sat down by her bed. At the same time some broth was suggested, which she took and found good. She remained thus for about half an hour, during which time her only words were to thank me for the attention I had given her, and she brought to these thanks that grace and charm which you know. She then maintained for some time an absolute silence, which she only broke to say, Ah, oh, yes, I remember coming here. And a moment later she cried pitifully, My friend, my friend, pity me, my misery is all coming back to me. Then, as I advanced towards her, she seized my hand, and resting her head upon it, "'Dear God,' she went on, "'can I not die, then?' Her expression, more than these words even, moved me to tears. She perceived them in my voice, and said to me, "'You pity me. Ha! <laughs> did you but know?' And then, interrupting herself, "'Arrange that we can be left alone, and I will tell you all.' As I believe I have informed you, I had my suspicions already as to what was to be the subject of this confidence, and, fearing that the conversation, which I foresaw would be long and sorrowful, might perhaps be harmful to the condition of our unhappy friend, I refused at first, under the pretext that she required rest. But she insisted, and I yielded to her instances. We were no sooner alone than she told me all that you have already heard from her, which, for that reason, I will not repeat to you. Finally, while speaking of the cruel fashion in which she had been sacrificed, she added, I felt very certain it would be my death, and had the courage for it. But what is impossible to me is to survive my misfortune and my shame. I tried to vanquish this discouragement, or rather this despair, with the arms of religion, which, hitherto, had such power over her but I soon perceived that I had not strength enough for these august functions, and I confined myself to a proposal to call in the Père Anselme, whom I knew to be entirely in her confidence. She agreed to this, and even seemed to desire it greatly. He was sent for and came at once. He stayed for a long time with the patient, and said, on leaving, that, if the physicians judged as he did, he thought the ceremony of the sacraments might be deferred, that he would return on the following day. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and until five our friend was fairly quiet, so much so that we had all regained hope. Unfortunately, a letter was brought up to her. When they would have given it her, she answered first that she would not receive any, and no one pressed it. But from that moment she showed great agitation. Shortly afterwards she asked whence this letter came. It had no postmark. Who had brought it? No one knew. From whom had it been sent? The portress had not been told. She then kept silence for some time, after which she began to speak, but her wandering talk only told us that she was again delirious. However, there was another quiet interval, 
until at last she requested that the letter which had been brought should be given her. As soon as she had cast her eyes on it, she cried, From him! Good God! And then, in a strong but oppressed voice, Take it back! Take it back! She had her bed curtains shut immediately and forbade anybody to come near her. But we were almost immediately compelled to return to her side. The frenzy had returned more violent than ever, and really terrible convulsions were joined to it. These attacks had not ceased by the evening, and this morning's bulletin informs me that the night has not been less stormy. In short, her state is such that I am astonished she has not already succumbed, and I will not hide from you that I have very little hope left. I suppose this unfortunate letter was from Monsieur de Valmont, but what can he still dare write to her? Forgive me, my dear friend, I refrain from all reflection, but it is cruel indeed to see a woman make so wretched an end who was hitherto so deservedly happy. Paris, 2nd of December, 1700 Letter the hundred and fiftieth, the Chevalier d'Anceny to the Marquise de Merteuil. While I wait for the happiness of seeing you, I abandon myself, my tender friend, to the pleasure of writing to you, and it is by occupying myself with you that I dispel my regret for your absence. To retrace my sentiments for you, to recall your own, is a real delight to my heart, and it is thus that even a time of privation offers me still a thousand benefits precious to my love. However, if I am to believe you, I shall obtain no reply from you. This very letter is to be the last, and we must refrain from a correspondence which, according to you, is dangerous, and of which we have no need. Assuredly, I will believe you, if you insist. For what can you wish that does not become my own wish, for that very reason? But, before being wholly resolved, will you not permit me to discuss the matter with you? Of the question of danger, you must be the sole judge. I can calculate nothing, and I confine myself to begging you to watch over your safety, for I can have no peace while you are uneasy. For this purpose, it is not we two who are but one, but you who are both of us. It is not the same with our wants. Here we can have but one thought, and if our opinion differs, it is perhaps only for lack of explanation or for misunderstanding. This then, methinks, is what I feel. No doubt a letter seems by no means indispensable when one can see each other freely. What could it say that a word, a glance, or even silence would not say a hundred times better still? This seems to me so true that, at the moment when you spoke of our ceasing to correspond, the idea easily crept into my soul. It troubled it, perhaps, but did not wound it. It is even, as it were, when, wishing to press a kiss upon your bosom, I meet with a ribbon or a veil, I do but thrust it aside and have no feeling of an obstacle. But since then we are separated, and now that you are no longer here, this thought of our correspondence has come back to torture me. Why, say I to myself, this privation the more? Nay, is it a reason, because one is far away, that one should have no more to say? I will assume that, favoured by circumstance, we pass a whole day together. Must we waste the time in talking which is meant for pleasure? Yes, for pleasure, my tender friend, for by your side even the moments of repose are full of a delicious enjoyment. But at last, however long the time may be, one ends by separation, and then one is all alone. It is then that a letter is precious. If one reads it not, at least one gazes at it. Ah, do not doubt, one may look at a letter without reading it, as, methinks, I should still find some pleasure in touching your portrait in the night. Your portrait, do I say? But a letter is the portrait of the soul. It has not, like a cold resemblance, that stagnation which is so remote from love. It lends itself to our every movement. By turns it is animated, feels enjoyment, is in repose. All your sentiments are so precious to me. Will you rob me of a means of cherishing them? Are you sure, pray, that the need to write to me will never torment you? In solitude, if your heart expands or is depressed, if a moment of joy thrills through your soul, if an involuntary sadness for a moment troubles it, where will you depose your gladness or your sorrow except upon the bosom of your friend? 
Will you, then, have a sentiment which he does not share? Will you allow yourself to be lost in solitary dreams apart? My love, my tender love, but it is your privilege to pronounce sentence. I did but wish to discuss, and not to beguile you. I do but give you reasons. I dare believe that my prayers have been of more avail. If you persist, therefore, I will endeavour not to grieve. I will make an effort to tell myself what you would have written to me, but ah, you would say it better than I, and above all, I should have more pleasure in hearing it. Adieu, my charming friend. The hour is drawing nigh when I shall be able to see you. I take leave of you in all haste that I may come and find you the sooner. Paris, 3rd of December, in 17... End of section 30 Section 31 of Dangerous Connections This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos Section 31, Letters 151 to 155 Letter the 151st, the Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil. I do not suppose, Marquise, that you deem me so inexperienced as to have failed to set its due value upon the tete-a-tete -tete in which I found you this evening, nor upon the remarkable chance which brought Danceny to your house. It is not that your practised countenance did not know marvellously well how to assume an expression of calm and serenity, nor that you betrayed yourself by any of those phrases which the lips of confusion or repentance sometimes let fall. I admit also that your docile gaze served you to perfection, and if it had but known how to make itself believed as well as understood, far from feeling or retaining the least suspicion, I should not have suspected for a moment the extreme vexation caused you by that importunate third party. But if you would not lavish such great talents in vain, if you would obtain the success you promised yourself, and produce, in short, the illusion you sought, you must begin by forming your novice of a lover with greater care. Since you are beginning to undertake educations, teach your pupils not to blush and be put out of countenance at the slightest pleasantry not to deny so earnestly in the case of one woman only the things against which they defend themselves so feebly in the case of all the others teach them again how to listen to the praises of their mistress without deeming themselves bound to do the honours for her. And if you permit them to gaze at you in company, let them at least know beforehand how to disguise that look of possession, so easy to recognise, which they confound so clumsily with that of love you will then be able to exhibit them in your public appearances without their conduct putting their sage instructress to the blush and i myself only too happy to have a hand in your celebrity promise to compose and publish the programmes of this new college but until then i am i confess astonished that it should be i whom you have chosen to treat like a schoolboy oh, on any other woman how speedily i would be avenged what a pleasure i should make of it 
and how far it would surpass that of which she believed she had robbed me yes it is indeed in your case alone that i can prefer reparation to revenge and do not think that i am held back by the least doubt the least uncertainty i know all you have been in paris for the last four days and every day you have seen danceny and you have seen him only even to-day your door was still closed and your porter only failed to prevent my reaching you for want of an assurance equal to your own none the less i was not to doubt you wrote to me that i should be the first to be informed of your arrival of that arrival of which you could not yet tell me the date although you wrote to me on the eve of your departure <laughs> will you deny these facts or will you attempt to excuse them either course is alike impossible and yet i still contain myself there you behold the force of your dominion but believe me rest satisfied with having tried it abuse it no more we both know one another marquise that word ought to suffice to-morrow you told me you will be out all day well and good if you are really going out and you may imagine that i shall know but at any rate you will return in the evening and for our difficult reconciliation the time betwixt then and the next morning will not be too long let me know then if it is to be at your house or in the other place that our numerous and reciprocal expiations are to be made above all no more of danceny your naughty head was full of his idea and i cannot be jealous of that frenzy of your imagination but reflect that from this moment what was but a fantasy would become a marked preference i do not think that i was made for such humiliations and i do not expect to receive them from you i even hope that this sacrifice will not seem one to you but even if it should cost you anything it seems to me that i have set you a fine enough example and that a woman of sensibility and beauty who lived for me alone who perhaps at this very moment is dying of love and regret is worth at least as much as a young schoolboy who lacks if you will neither good looks nor intelligence but who as yet has neither constancy nor knowledge of the world adieu marquise i say nothing of my sentiments towards you all that i can do at this moment is not to search my heart i wait for your reply reflect when you make it reflect carefully that the easier it is for you to make me forget the offence you have given me the more indelibly would a refusal on your part a simple postponement even engrave it upon my heart <sighs> paris third december Seventeen. Mm. Letter the hundred and fifty second. The Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont. Pray have a care, Vicomte, and show more respect to my extreme timidity. 
how do you suppose that i can endure the overwhelming thought of incurring your wrath and above all how can i fail to succumb to the fear of your vengeance the more so in that as you know if you were to blacken me it would be impossible for me to retaliate i might speak indeed but your existence would be none the less brilliant and calm in fact what would you have to fear to be sure you would be obliged to leave if the time were left you for it but can one not live abroad as well as here and all considered provided that the court of france left you in peace at whatever one you had chosen for your abode it would merely be a case of shifting the scene of your triumphs having attempted to restore your coolness by these moral considerations let us return to business do you know vicomte why i have never married again it is not assuredly for lack of advantageous offers it is solely in order that nobody should have the right to dictate my actions it is not even that i was afraid of no longer being able to carry out my wishes for i should always have ended by doing that but that it would have been a burden to me that any one should have had the right merely to complain of them it is in short because i wished only to deceive for my pleasure and not from necessity and here you are writing me the most marital letter that it is possible to receive you speak to me of nothing but the injuries on my side the favours on yours but how pray can one be lacking to one to whom one owes no wit i am unable to conceive it let us consider what is all this ado about you found danceny with me and it displeased you well and good but what conclusion can you have drawn from it either it was the result of chance as i told you or of my will as i did not tell you in the first case your letter is unjust in the second it is ridiculous it was indeed worth the trouble of writing but you are jealous and jealousy does not reason very well let me reason for you either you have a rival or you have not if you have one you must please in order to be preferred to him if you have not you must still please in order to avoid having one in both cases the same conduct is to be observed why therefore torment yourself above all why torment me do you no longer know how to be the most amiable and are you no longer sure of your successes come now vicomte you do yourself an injustice but it is not that it is that in your eyes i am not worth your putting yourself to so much trouble you are less desirous of my favours than you are of abusing your empire there you are an ingrate that is enough sentiment methinks and if i were to continue a very little longer this letter might well turn to tenderness but that you do not deserve you deserve just as little that i should justify myself to punish you for your suspicions you shall retain them of the time of my return therefore just as of the visits of danceny i shall tell you nothing you have taken mighty pains to inform yourself have you not very well are you any more advanced i hope it has given you a great deal of pleasure i can tell you it has not interfered with mine all i can say then in reply to your threatening letter is that it has neither the fortune to please me nor the power to intimidate me and that for the moment i could not be less disposed than i am to grant your request in truth to accept you such as you show yourself to-day would be to commit a real infidelity to you it would not be a renewal with my old lover it would be to take a fresh one and one by no means worth the old i have not so far forgotten the first that i should so deceive myself the valmont whom i loved was charming i will even admit that i have never encountered a man more amiable ah let me beg you vicomte if you find him again to bring him to see me he will always be well received 
warn him however that in no case will it be for today or tomorrow his manish mu has somewhat injured him and if i were in too much haste i should be afraid of making a mistake or perhaps if you like i have pledged my word to Doncigny for those two days and your letter has taught me that it is no joking matter with you when one breaks one's word you see then that you must wait but what does it matter to you you can always avenge yourself on your rival he will do no worse to your mistress than you will do to his and after all is not one woman as good as another she even who should be tender and sensitive who should live for you alone who in short should die from love and regret would be none the less sacrificed to the first fantasy to the dread of a moment's ridicule and you would have one put oneself about ah oh, that is not fair adieu vicomte pray become amiable once more you see i ask nothing better than to find you charming and as soon as i am sure of it i undertake to give you the proof truly i am too kind paris fourth of december seventeen letter the hundred and fifty third the vicomte de valmont to the marquise de merteuil <sighs> i answer your letter at once and i will try to be clear a thing which is not easy with you when once you have made up your mind not to understand long phrases were not required to establish the fact that when each of us possesses all that is necessary to ruin the other we have a like interest in mutual consideration there is no question therefore of that but between the violent course of destroying one another and that doubtless the better of remaining united as we have been of becoming even more so by resuming our old liaison between these two courses i say there are a thousand others to adopt it was not ridiculous therefore to tell you nor is it to repeat that from this day forward i will be either your lover or your enemy i am admirably conscious that this choice will embarrass you that it would suit you better to beat about the bush but i am quite aware that you have never loved to be placed thus betwixt a plain yes or no but you must also feel that i cannot let you out of this narrow circle without running the risk of being tricked and you may have foreseen that i would not endure that it is for you now to decide i am able to leave you the choice but not to remain in uncertainty i warn you only that you will not impose on me by your arguments be they good or bad that neither will you seduce me by any more of those cajoleries with which you seek to adorn your refusals and that at last the time for frankness has arrived i ask nothing better than to be able to set you the example and i declare to you with pleasure that i prefer peace and union but if both are to be broken i believe the right and the means are mine i will add then that the least obstacle presented by you will be taken by me as a veritable declaration of war you will see that the answer i exact from you requires neither long nor fine phrases two words will suffice paris fourth december Seventeen.
Reply of the Marquise de Merteuil, written at the foot of the above letter. Very well. War. Letter the 154th, Madame de Volange to Madame de Rosemonde. The bulletins will inform you better than I can do, my dear friend, of the grievous state of our patient. Utterly absorbed, as I am, in my care of her, I only snatch from it the time to write to you, when there are any incidents to relate, other than those of the malady. Here is one, for which I was certainly unprepared. It is a letter which I have received from M. de Valmont, who has been pleased to choose me as his confidant, or rather as his mediator with Madame de Tauvel, for whom he has also enclosed a letter in mine. I have sent back the one, and replied to the other. The latter I forward to you, and I think you will judge, like myself, that I could not and ought not to have complied with his request. Even had I been willing, our unfortunate friend would not have been in a condition to understand me. Her delirium is continuous. But what do you think of this despair of M. de Valmont? First, is one to believe in it, or does he but wish to deceive everybody to the very end? Note. It is because we have discovered nothing in the subsequent correspondence which can solve this doubt that we have decided to suppress M. de Valmont's letter. If, for once, he is sincere, he may well say that he has been himself the cause of his own misfortune. I expect he will be hardly pleased with my answer, but I confess that all I see of this unhappy adventure excites me more and more against its author. Adieu, my dear friend. I am going to resume my sad task, which becomes even more so from the scant hope I feel of seeing it succeed. You know my sentiments towards you. Paris, 5th of December, 1700 Letter the 155th The Vicomte de Valmont to the Chevalier d'Ancenis I have called upon you twice, my dear Chevalier. But since you have abandoned the role of lover to take up that of the man of gallant conquest, you have naturally become invisible. Your valet de chambre, however, assured me that you would return this evening, that he had orders to await you. But I, who am acquainted with your plans, understood quite well that you would only enter for a moment to put on the suitable costume and would promptly recommence your victorious progress tis very well and i cannot but applaud you for it but perhaps for this evening you will be tempted to change your direction as yet you do but know one half of your occupations i must make you acquainted with the other and then you shall decide take the time then to read my letter it will not tend to distract you from your pleasures since on the contrary it has no other object than to offer you a choice of them if I had possessed your whole confidence, if I had heard from yourself that part of your secret which you have left me to divine, I should have been informed in time, and my zeal would have been less inopportune, and would not impede your movements to-day. But let us start from where we are. Whatever course you were to take, your rejected would always make another happy. You have a rendezvous to-night, have you not, with a charming woman whom you adore? <laughs> For at your age, who is the woman one does not adore, at least for the first week? The setting of the scene must enhance your pleasures, a delicious petite maison which has been taken only for you is to adorn voluptuousness with the charms of liberty and of mystery all is arranged you are expected 
and you burn to betake yourself there we both know that although you have said no word of it to me now here is what you do not know and what i have to tell you since my return to paris i have been busy over the means of bringing you and mademoiselle de volanges together i promised you this and on the very last occasion when i spoke of it to you i had reason to judge from your replies i might say from your transports that in this i was promoting your happiness i could not succeed in this difficult enterprise by myself alone but after preparing the means i left the rest to the zeal of your young mistress her love has discovered resources which my experience lacked in short it is your misfortune that she has succeeded two days since as she told me this evening every obstacle was surmounted and your happiness only depends on yourself for two days also she flattered herself that she would be able to give you this news herself and in spite of her mamma's absence you would have been received but you have not even presented yourself and to tell you the truth whether it be reason or caprice the little person seemed to me somewhat vexed at this lack of eagerness on your part at last she found a means of summoning me to her and made me promise to forward the enclosed letter to you as soon as possible hmm. from the emphasis she laid upon it i would wager it is a question of a rendezvous for to-night be that as it may i promised upon my honour and my friendship that you should have the tender missive in the course of to-day and i cannot and will not break my word now young man what is your conduct to be placed between coquetry and love between pleasure and happiness which will be your choice if i were speaking to the danceny of three months ago nay even of a week ago i should be as certain of his behaviour as i was of his heart but the danceny of to-day led away by the women running after adventures and grown as the usage is somewhat of a rake will he prefer a very shy young girl who only offers him her beauty her innocence and her love to the attractions of a woman who is certainly very well worn for my part my dear friend it seems to me that even with your new principles which i quite admit are shared also in some degree by myself i should decide under the circumstances for the younger flame to begin with it is one the more and then the novelty and again the fear of losing the fruit of your labour by neglecting to cull it for on that side in short it would be really an opportunity missed and it does not always return especially in the case of a first frailty when such are in question often it needs but one moment of ill humour one jealous suspicion less even to prevent the most handsome triumph drowning virtue sometimes clings to a straw and once escaped it keeps upon its guard and is no longer easily surprised on the other side on the contrary what do you risk not even a rupture a quarrel at the most 
whereby you purchase at the cost of a few attentions the pleasure of a reconciliation what other course remains for a woman who has already given herself save that of indulgence what would she gain by severity the loss of her pleasures with no profit to her glory oh, if as i assume you choose the path of love which seems to me also that of reason i should consider it prudent to send no excuses to the rendezvous let yourself be expected quite simply if you risk giving a reason there will be perhaps a temptation to verify it women are curious and obstinate all might be discovered as you know i am myself just now an example of this but if you leave a hope as it will be sustained by vanity it will not be lost until long after the proper hour for seeking information then to-morrow you will be able to select the insurmountable obstacle which will have detained you you will have been ill dead if necessary or anything else which will have caused you equal despair and all will be right again for the rest whichever course you adopt i only ask you to inform me of it and as i have no interest in the matter i shall in any case think that you have done well adieu my dear friend i add one thing more that i regret madame de tourvel that i am in despair at being separated from her that i would pay with half my life for the privilege of consecrating the other half to her oh believe me love is one's only happiness paris fifth december seventeen End of section 31。section 32 of dangerous connections。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。dangerous connections by pierre coderlo de la clos。Section 32, letters 156 to 160. Letter the 156th, Cécile Volange to the Chevalier d'Anceny, enclosed in the preceding. How is it, my dear friend, that I see you no longer, when I never cease to desire it? Do you no longer care so much about it as I do? Ah, nowadays I am very sad indeed, sadder even than when we were entirely separated the pain i once had through others comes now from you and that hurts far more you know quite well that it is some days since mamma has been away from home and i hoped you would try and profit by this time of freedom but you do not even think of me i am very unhappy you told me so often that my love was less than yours i knew the contrary and here is the proof if you had come to see me you would have seen me indeed for I am not like you. I only think of what will reunite us. If you had your deserts, I would not say anything of all I have done for that, and of the trouble it has given me. But I love you too well, and I wish so much to see you that I cannot refrain from telling you. And then I shall soon see afterwards if you really love me. I have managed so well that the porter is in our interests, and he has promised me that, whenever you came, he would let you in, as though he didn't see you, and we can depend upon him, for he is a very obliging man. It is only a question, then, of keeping out of sight in the house, and that is very easy if you come at night, when there is nothing at all to fear. For instance, since Mamma has been going out every day, 
she goes to bed every night at eleven o'clock so that we should have plenty of time the porter told me that if she should come like that instead of knocking on the gate you would only have to knock at his window and he would open at once for you and then you will easily find the back staircase and as you will not be able to have a light i will leave the door of my room ajar which will always give you a little light you must take great care not to make any noise especially in passing mamma's back door as for my maids that is no matter as she has promised me not to awake she is a very good girl too and to leave it will be just the same now we shall see if you will come ah oh god why does my heart beat so fast while i write to you is some misfortune going to come to me or is it the hope of seeing you which troubles me like this what i feel most is that i have never loved you so much and had never longed so much to tell you so come then my friend my dear friend that i may be able to repeat to you a hundred times that i love you that i adore you that i shall never love any one but you i have found the means of informing monsieur de valmont that i have something to say to him and as he is a very good friend he is sure to come to-morrow and i will beg him to give you this letter immediately so that i shall expect you to-morrow night and you will come without fail if you would not make your cecile very unhappy adieu my dear friend i embrace you with all my heart paris fourth of december seventeen in the evening letter one hundred and fifty seven the chevalier d'ancenis to the vicomte de valmont do not doubt my dear vicomte either of my heart or of my proceedings how could i resist a desire of my dear cecile's ah, it is indeed she she alone whom i love and whom i shall always love her ingenuousness her tenderness have a charm for me for which i may have been weak enough to allow myself to be distracted but which nothing will ever efface embarked upon another adventure without so to speak having perceived it often has the memory of cecile come to trouble me in the midst of my sweetest pleasures and perhaps my heart has never rendered her truer homage than at the very moment i was unfaithful to her however my friend let us spare her delicacy and hide my wrongdoings from her not to surprise her but so as not to give her pain cecile's happiness is the most ardent vow that i frame I would never forgive myself a fault which had cost her a tear. I feel I have deserved your jesting remarks upon what you call my new principles, but you can believe me when I say that it is not by them I am guided at this moment, and from tomorrow I am determined to prove it. I will go and accuse myself to the very woman who has been the cause of my error, who has participated in it. I will say to her, read my heart. It has the most tender friendship for you, friendship united to desire so greatly resembles love. Both of us have been deceived, but, though susceptible to error, I am not capable of breach of faith. I know, my friend. She is as noble as she is indulgent. She will do more than pardon me. She will approve. She herself often reproached herself with betraying friendship. Often her delicacy took alarm at her love. Wiser than I, she would strengthen in my soul those useful fears which I rashly sought to stifle in hers. I shall owe it to her that I am better, as to you that I am happier. Oh, my friends, divide my gratitude. The idea that I owe my happiness to you enhances its value. Adieu, my dear Vicomte. The excess of my joy does not prevent me from thinking of your sorrows and from sharing them. Why can I not be of use to you? Does Madame de Torvel remain inexorable then? I am told also that she is very ill. God, how I pity you! May she regain at the same time her health and her indulgence, and forever make your happiness. These are the praise of friendship. I dare hope that they will be heard by love. I should like to talk longer with you, but the hour approaches, and perhaps Cecile already awaits me. Paris 5th of December, in 17... Letter the 158th The Vicomte de Valmont to the Marquise de Merteuil Upon awaking 
<sighs> upon awaking well well marquise how are you after the pleasures of last night are you not somewhat fatigued by them <laughs> admit now that danceny is charming he performs prodigies this youth you did not expect it of him am i not right indeed i will do myself justice i richly deserved to be sacrificed to such a rival seriously he is full of good qualities but above all what love what constancy what delicacy oh if you were ever to be loved by him as his cecile is you would have no rivals to fear he proved that to you last night perhaps by dint of coquetry another woman may rob you of him for a moment a young man can hardly refuse enticing provocations but a single word from the beloved object suffices as you see to dispel this illusion thus you have only to be that object in order to become perfectly happy you will surely make no mistake there you have too sure a tact that you need ever fear that however the friendship which unites us as sincere on my part as it is recognized on yours made me desire for you the experience of last night it is the work of my zeal it has succeeded but i pray you no thanks it is not worth the pains nothing could have been easier in fact what did it cost me a slight sacrifice and a little skill i consented to share the favours of his mistress with the young man but after all he has as much right to them as i and i took such scant account of them the letter which the young person wrote to him was of course dictated by me but it was only to gain time because we had a better use for it the one i added to it oh, that was nothing next to nothing a few friendly reflections to guide the new lover's choice but upon my honour they were not required the truth must be told he did not hesitate for an instant moreover in his candour he is to go to you to-day to tell you everything and assuredly the story will please you mightily he will say to you read my heart this he has told me and you quite see that that repairs everything i hope that while reading what he would have you will also perhaps read that such young lovers have their dangers and again that it is better to have me for a friend than an enemy adieu marquise until the next occasion paris sixth december seventeen Letter the hundred and fifty ninth, the Marquise de Merteuil to the Vicomte de Valmont. I do not like people to follow up sorry conduct with sorry jests. It is neither in my manner nor to my taste. When I have ground of complaint against people, I do not quiz them. I do better. I avenge myself However satisfied with yourself you may be at the present moment, do not forget that it would not be the first time if you were to find that you were premature 
and quite alone in applauding yourself in the hope of a triumph which had escaped you at the very moment when you were congratulating yourself upon it adieu paris sixth of december seventeen letter the hundred and sixtieth madame de volanges to madame de rosemonde i write to you from the chamber of your unhappy friend whose state has remained almost always the same there is to be a consultation of four physicians this afternoon that is unhappily as you know more often a proof of danger than a means of relief it seems however that her mind was somewhat restored last night the waiting-maid informed me this morning that just before midnight her mistress called her, that she wished to be alone with her, and that she dictated to her a fairly long letter. Julie added that, whilst she was busy in making the envelope for it, Madame de Tourvel's delirium returned, so that the girl did not know to whom she was to address it. I was astonished at first that the letter itself had not been sufficient to inform her, upon which she answered me that she feared to make a mistake, that her mistress, however, had greatly charged her to have it dispatched immediately. I took upon myself to open the packet. I found there the communication which I send you, which, in fact, is addressed to everybody and to nobody. I think, however, that it was to Monsieur de Valmont that our unhappy friend meant at first to write, but that she gave way, without perceiving it, to the disorder of her ideas. I judged that the letter should not be given to anybody. I send it to you, because you will learn from it, better than you can from me, what are the thoughts which fill our patient's head. As long as she remains so keenly affected, I shall have no hope. The body recovers with difficulty, when the mind is so ill at ease. Adieu, my dear and revered friend. I congratulate you upon being at a distance from the sad spectacle which is continually before my eyes. Paris, 6th of December, 1700 End of section 32「Section 33 of Dangerous Connections」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos, Section 33, Letters 161 to 165. Letter the 161st, the President de Tourvel to... Dictated by her and written by her waiting maid. Cruel and wicked being, will you never cease to persecute me? Does it not suffice you to have tortured, degraded, vilified me? Would you ravish from me even the peace of the grave? What, in this abode of shadow where ignominy has forced me to bury myself, are my sorrows to be without cessation? Is hope to be unknown? I do not implore for mercy which I do not deserve. To suffer without complaining, I shall be content if my sufferings do not exceed my strength. But do not render my torments unbearable. In leaving me my sorrow, take away from me the cruel memory of the good I have lost. When you have ravished it from me, trace no more before my eyes its desolating image. I was innocent and at peace. Because I saw you, I lost my repose. By listening to you I became criminal. Author of my faults, what right have you to punish them? Where are the friends who cherished me? Where are they? My misfortune has terrified them. None dares come near me. I am borne down, and they leave me without succour. I am dying, and no one weeps over me. All consolation is refused me. Pity stops short on the brink of the abyss into which the guilty one is plunged. She is torn by remorse, and her cries are not heeded. And you, whom I have outraged, you whose esteem adds to my punishment, you who alone would have the right to avenge yourself on me, what are you doing far away from me? Come and punish an unfaithful wife. 
Let me suffer at last the torments I have deserved. I should have already submitted to your vengeance, but the courage failed me to tell you of your shame. It was not dissimulation, it was respect. Let this letter at least tell you of my repentance. Heaven has taken your part. It avenges you for a wrong you do not know. Tis heaven which has tied my tongue and retained my words. It feared lest you should remit a fault which it wished to punish. It has withdrawn me from your indulgence which would have infringed its justice. Pitiless in its vengeance, it has abandoned me to the very one who ruined me. It is at once for him and through him that I suffer. I seek to flee him in vain. He follows me. He is there. He assails me unceasingly. But how different he is from himself! His eyes express naught but hatred and contempt. His lips proffer only insults and reproach. His arms are only thrown round me to destroy me. Who will save me from his barbarous fury? But what? It is he. I am not mistaken. It is he whom I see once more. Oh, my beloved, take me in your arms, hide me in your bosom. Yes, it is you. It is indeed you. What dread illusion made me misunderstand you? How I have suffered in your absence! Let us part no more. Let us never part again. Let me breathe. Feel my heart, how it throbs. Ah, oh, it is with fear no longer. It is the soft emotion of love. Why do you turn away from my tender caresses? Cast your sweet glance upon me. What are those bonds you were trying to break? Why are you getting ready those preparations for death? What can change your features thus? What are you doing? Leave me. I shudder. God, it is that monster again. My friends, do not desert me. You who urged me to fly from him, help me to struggle against him. And you, more indulgent, who promised me a diminution of my pains, come to my side. Where have you both gone? If I am not allowed to see you again, at least answer this letter. Let me know that you still love me. Leave me, then, cruel one. What fresh fury seizes you? Do you fear lest any gentle sentiment should penetrate my soul? You redouble my torments. You force me to hate you. Oh, what a grievous thing is hatred! How it corrodes the heart which distills it! Why do you persecute me? What more can you have to say to me? Have you not made it as impossible for me to listen to you as to answer you? Expect nothing more of me. Monsieur, farewell. Paris, 5th December, 17, blank. Letter the 162nd. The Chevalier d'Ancenny to the Vicomte de Valmont. I am acquainted, monsieur, with your behaviour to me. I know also that not content with having unworthily tricked me, you have not feared to vaunt and applaud yourself for it. I have seen the proof of your treachery written in your own hand. I confess that my heart was sick and that I felt a certain shame at having assisted somewhat myself at the odious abuse you made of my blind confidence. I do not, however, envy you this shameful advantage. I am only curious to learn whether you would preserve them all alike over me. I shall know this if, as I hope, you will be ready to meet me tomorrow, between eight and nine o'clock in the morning, at the entrance to the Bois de Vincen by the village of saint Mande. I will be careful to have there all that is necessary for the explanations which I still have to obtain from you. The Chevalier d'Ancenny, Paris, 6th of December, in 17... in the evening. Letter the hundred and sixty third Monsieur Bertrand to Madame de Rosemonde Madame, it is with great regret that I undertake the sad task of announcing to you news which will cause you such cruel sorrow. Allow me, first, to recommend to you that pious resignation which we have all so much admired in you, and which alone enables us to support the ills with which our wretched life is strewn. Your nephew, gracious heaven, must I afflict so greatly so venerable a lady? Your nephew has had the misfortune to fall in a remarkable duel which he had this morning with Monsieur Le Chevalier 
Dancenay. I am entirely ignorant of the motive of this quarrel, but it appears, from the missive which I found still in the pocket of Monsieur le Vicomte, and which I have the honor to forward you, it appears, I say, that he was not the aggressor. Yet it needs must be he whom heaven allowed to fall. I have been to wait upon Monsieur le Vicomte precisely at the hour when he was brought back to the hotel. Imagine my terror when I saw your nephew carried by two of his servants and bathed in his blood. He had two sword thrusts through his body and was already very weak. Monsieur Dunsinet was there also, and even he wept. Ah, certainly he has reason to weep. But it is a fine time to shed tears when one has caused an irreparable misfortune. As for me, I could not contain myself, and in spite of my humble condition, I none the less told him my fashion of thinking. But it was then that Monsieur Vicomte showed himself truly great. He ordered me to be silent, and to taking the hand of the very man who was his murderer, he called him his friend, embraced him before us all, and said to us, I command you to treat Monsieur with all the consideration that is due to a brave and gallant man. He further caused him to be presented, in my presence, with a voluminous mass of papers, the contents of which I am not acquainted with, but to which I am well aware he attached vast importance. He then desired that we should leave them alone together for a moment. Meanwhile, I had sent in search of every kind of succor, both spiritual and temporal. But alas, the ill was incurable. Less than half an hour later, Monsieur le Vicomte lost consciousness. He was only able to receive extreme unction, and the ceremony was hardly over when he rendered his last breath. Great God! When I received in my arms at his birth this precious prop of so illustrious a house, how little did I foresee that it was to be in my arms that he would expire, and that I should have to weep for his death a death so premature and so unfortunate. My tears flow in spite of myself. I ask your pardon, madame, for thus daring to mingle my grief with your own, but in every condition we have hearts and sensibility, and I should be ungrateful indeed if I did not weep all my life for a lord who showed me so much kindness and honored me with so great confidence. Tomorrow, after the removal of the body, I will have the seals placed on everything, and you can depend entirely on my care. You will be aware, madame, that this unhappy event cuts off the entail, and leaves the disposition of your property entirely free. If I can be of any use to you, I beg you to be good enough to convey to me your wishes. I will employ all my zeal in their punctual fulfillment. I remain, with the most profound respect, madame, your most humble, etc. Bertrand, Paris, 7th December, 17. Letter the 164th, Madame de Rosemonde to Monsieur Bertrand. I have this moment received your letter, my dear Bertrand, and learn from it the fearful event of which my nephew has been the unhappy victim. Yes, I shall doubtless have orders to give you and it is only on account of them that I can occupy myself with anything else than my mortal affliction. The letter of Monsieur d'Arsigny, which you have sent me, is a very convincing proof that it was he who provoked the duel, and it is my intention that you should immediately lodge a complaint, and in my name. My nephew may have satisfied his natural generosity in pardoning his enemy and murderer, but it is my duty to avenge at the same time his death humanity and religion one cannot be too eager to invoke the severity of the law against this remnant of barbarism and i do not believe that this is a case in which we are required to pardon injuries i expect you then to pursue this matter with all the zeal and activity of which i know you to be capable and which you owe to my nephew's memory you will be sure before all to see monsieur le president de on my behalf, and confer with him on the subject. I have not written to him, eager as I am to be left quite alone with my sorrow. You will convey him my excuses, and communicate this letter to him. 
Adieu, my dear Bertrand. I praise and thank you for your kind sentiments, and am for life entirely yours. At the Chateau de 8th December, 17. Letter the 165th, Madame de Volanges to Madame de Rosemonde. I know you are already acquainted, my dear and revered friend, with the loss you have just sustained. I knew your affection for M. de Valmont, and I participate most sincerely in the affliction which you must feel. I am truly grieved to have to add a fresh regret to those which are trying you already. But, alas, you have only your tears now to bestow upon our unhappy friend. We lost her yesterday at eleven o'clock at night. By a fatality which attended her lot, and which seemed to make a mock of all human prudence, the short interval by which she survived M. de Valmont sufficed to inform her of his death, and, as she herself said, to enable her not to succumb beneath the weight of her misfortunes until the measure of them was full. You are aware, of course, that for more than two days she was absolutely without consciousness, and even yesterday morning, when her physician arrived, and we approached her bedside, she recognized neither of us, and we could not extract the least word or sign from her. Well, hardly had we returned to the chimney, and the physician was relating to me the sad episode of M. de Valmont's death, when the unfortunate woman recovered her reason, whether that nature alone had produced this revolution, or that it was caused by the repetition of the words Monsieur de Valmont and death, which may have brought back to the patient the only ideas which have occupied her for a long time. However that may be, she hurriedly threw back the curtains of her bed, crying out, What? What are you saying? Monsieur de Valmont is dead? I hoped to make her believe that she was mistaken, and at first assured her that she had heard wrong. But far from letting herself be persuaded, she required the physician to repeat the cruel story, and, upon my endeavouring again to dissuade her, she called me and whispered, Why wish to deceive me? Was he not already dead to me? It was necessary, therefore, to yield. Our unhappy friend listened, at first, with a fairly tranquil air, but soon afterwards she interrupted the story, saying, Enough, I know enough. She asked at once for her curtains to be closed, and, when the physician subsequently tried to busy himself with the care of her condition, she never would have him near her. As soon as he had left, she similarly dismissed her nurse and waiting maid, and when we were left alone, she begged me to help her to kneel down upon her bed and support her so. There she stayed for some time in silence, and with no other expression than that which was given by her tears, which flowed copiously. At last, clasping her hands and raising them to heaven, Almighty God, said she, in a weak but fervent voice, I submit myself to thy justice, but forgive Valmont. Let not my misfortunes, which I admit are deserved, be a cause of reproach to him and I will bless thy mercy. I have permitted myself, my dear and respected friend, to enter into these details on a subject which I am well aware must renew and aggravate your grief, because I have no doubt that that prayer of Madame de Tourvel's will, nevertheless, be a great consolation to your soul. After our friend had uttered these brief words, she fell back in my arms, and she was hardly replaced in her bed, when she was overcome by weakness, which lasted long, but which gave way to the ordinary remedies. As soon as she had regained consciousness, she asked me to send for the Père Anselme, and added, He is now the only physician whom I need. I feel that my ills will soon be ended. She complained much of oppression, and spoke with difficulty. A short time afterwards, she handed me, through her waiting-maid, a casket which I am sending to you, which she tells me contains papers of hers, and which she charged me to convey to you immediately after her death. Note. 
This casket contained all the letters relating to her adventure with M. de Valmont. She next spoke to me of you and of your friendship for her, so far as her situation permitted, and with much emotion. The pair Anselme arrived about four o'clock and remained alone with her for nearly an hour. When we returned, the face of the sick woman was calm and serene, but it was easy to see that the pair Anselme had shed many tears. He remained to assist at the last ceremonies of the church. This spectacle, always so imposing and so sorrowful, was rendered even more so by the contrast which the tranquil resignation of the sufferer formed with the profound grief of her venerable confessor, who burst into tears at her side. The emotion became general, and she, for whom everybody wept, was the only one not to weep. The remainder of the day was spent in the customary prayers, which were only interrupted by the sufferer's frequent fits of weakness. At last, at about eleven o'clock at night, she appeared to be more oppressed and to suffer more. I put out my hand to seek her arm. She had still strength enough to take it, and she placed it upon her heart. I could no longer discern any movement, and, indeed, at that very moment, our unfortunate friend expired. You will remember, my dear friend, that, on your last visit here, not a year ago, when we talked together of certain persons whose happiness seemed to us more or less assured, we dwelt complacently upon the lot of this very woman, whose misfortunes and whose death we lament to-day. So many virtues, laudable qualities and attractions, a character so sweet and easy, a husband whom she loved, and by whom she was adored, a society which pleased her, and of which she was the delight, a face, youth, fortune, so many combined advantages lost through a single imprudence. O oh, Providence, doubtless we must worship thy decrees, but how incomprehensible they are! I stop myself, I fear to add to your sorrow by indulging my own. I leave you to return to my daughter, who is a little indisposed. When she heard from me this morning of so sudden a death of two persons of her acquaintance, she was taken ill, and I had her sent to bed. I hope, however, that this slight indisposition will have no ill results. At her age, one is not yet habituated to sorrow, and its impression is keener and more potent. Such sensibility is, doubtless, a praiseworthy quality. But how greatly does all that we daily see teach us to dread it! Adieu, my dear and venerable friend. Paris, 9th of December, 1700 End of section 33section thirty four of dangerous connections this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dangerous connections by pierre coderlo de la clos section thirty four letters one hundred and sixty six to one hundred and seventy letter the hundred and sixty sixth monsieur bertrand to madame de rosemonde Madame, in consequence of the orders which you have done me the honor of sending me, I have had that of seeing Monsieur le Présidente, and have communicated your letter to him, informing him that, in pursuance of your wishes, I should do nothing without his advice. The Honorable Magistrate desires me to point out to you that the complaint which you intend to lodge against Monsieur le Chevalier d'Ancenay would be compromising to the memory of your nephew and that his honor would also inevitably be tarnished by the decree of the court, which would, of course, be a great misfortune. His opinion, therefore, is that you should carefully abstain from taking any proceedings, and that what you had better do, on the contrary, would be to endeavor to prevent the government from taking cognizance of this unfortunate adventure, which has already made too much noise. These observations seemed to me 
full of wisdom, and I resolve to wait for further orders from you. Allow me to beg you, madame, to be so good, when you dispatch them, as to add a word as to the state of your health, the sad effect upon which, of so many troubles, I greatly dread. I hope that you will pardon this liberty, in consideration of my attachment and my zeal. I am with respect, madame, your, etc. Paris, 10th December, 17. Letter the 167th, Anonymous, to Monsieur le Chevalier d'Anceny. Monsieur, I have the honor to inform you that this morning, in the corridors of the court, there was talk amongst the king's officers of the affair which you had, a few days ago, with Monsieur le Vicomte de Valmont, and that it is to be feared that the government will take proceedings against you. I thought that this warning might be of use to you, either to enable you to seek out what protection you have, to ward off these vexatious results, or, in the event of your being unable to succeed in this, to put you in a position to take measures for your personal safety. If you will even permit me to give you a piece of advice, I think you would do well to show yourself less often than you have done during the last few days. Although, ordinarily, affairs of this sort are treated with indulgence, this respect nevertheless continues due to the law. This precaution becomes all the more necessary in that it has come to my ears that a certain Madame de Rosamond, who, I am told, is an aunt of Monsieur Le Valmont, wished to lodge a complaint against you, in which event the public officers could not refuse her requisition. It would not be amiss, perhaps, if you were able to communicate with this lady. Private reasons prevent me from signing this letter but I am acting on the consideration that you will not render less justice to the sentiment which has dictated it, because you know not from whom it comes. I have the honor to be, etc. Paris, 10th December, 17. Letter the 168th, Madame de Volange to Madame de Rosemonde. Most surprising and distressing rumors, my dear and revered friend, are being disseminated here in relation to Madame de Merteuil. I am, assuredly, very far from believing them, and I would wager well that it is nothing but a hideous calumny. But I am too well aware of the ease with which even the most improbable slanders acquire credit, and of the difficulty with which the impression they leave is effaced, not to be greatly alarmed at these, easy as I believe it to be to refute them. I should wish, above all, that they could be stopped in good time, before they have spread further. But I only knew yesterday, at a late hour, of these horrors which they were fast beginning to retail, and when I sent this morning to Madame de Merteuil, she had just left for the country, where she was to spend two days. They were not able to tell me to whom she had gone. Her second woman, whom I sent for to speak with me, told me that her mistress had left no orders, save that she was to be expected on Thursday next, and none of the servants whom she has left here know any more. For myself, I have no notion where she may be. I cannot recollect any person of her acquaintance who stays so late in the country. However that may be, you will be able, I hope, between now and her return, to furnish me with information which will be of use to her for these odious stories are based on the circumstances of M. de Valmont's death. You are likely to have been informed of them, if they are true, or, at any rate, it will be easy for you to obtain information, which I beg you to do. This is what is being published, or rather, whispered, at present, but it will certainly not be long before it spreads further. It is said that the quarrel between M. de Valmont and the Chevalier d'Anceny was the work of Madame de Merteuil, who deceived them both alike. That, as happens almost always, the two rivals began by fighting and only arrived at explanations afterwards. That these explanations brought about a sincere reconciliation, and that, in order to expose Madame de Merteuil to the Chevalier d'Anceny, and also to justify himself entirely, 
Monsieur de Valmont supported his revelations by a heap of letters, forming a regular correspondence which he had maintained with her, and in which she relates the most scandalous anecdotes about herself, and in the freest of styles. People further say that Danceny, in the first heat of his indignation, showed these letters to all who wished to see them, and that they are now making the round of Paris. Two of them in particular are quoted. Note, letters the 81st and 85th of this collection. One in which she relates the whole history of her life and principle, and which is said to attain the height of horror. The other, which entirely justifies M. de Prévan, whose story you will remember, by the proof it contains that all he did was to yield to the most marked advances on the part of Madame de Merteuil, and that the rendezvous was arranged with her. I have, happily, the strongest reasons to believe that these imputations are as false as they are odious. First, we are both aware that M. de Valmont was assuredly not occupied with Madame de Merteuil, and I have every cause to believe that Danceny was equally without interest in her. Thus it seems to me clearly proved that she can have been neither the motive nor the author of the quarrel. I equally fail to understand what interest Madame de Merteuil can have had, assuming her to have been in concert with M. de Prévan, in making a scene which could only be disagreeable by its publicity, and which might become most dangerous to her, since she made, thereby, an irreconcilable enemy of a man who was master in part of a secret, and who, at that time, had numerous partisans. However, it is remarkable that since that adventure not a single voice has been raised in Prévan's favour, and that even from his own side there has been no protest made. These reflections would lead me to suspect the author of the rumours which are abroad to-day, and to look upon these slanders as the work of the hatred and vengeance of a man who, knowing himself to be ruined, hopes, by such a means, at least to establish a doubt, and perhaps cause a useful diversion. But, from whatever source these malicious reports arise, the most urgent thing is to destroy them. They would cease of themselves if it were to be shown, as is probable, that M. de Valmont and Danceny had no communication after their unfortunate affair, and that no papers passed between them. In my impatience to verify these facts, I sent this morning to M. Danceny. He is not in Paris either. His people told my valet de chambre that he had left in the night, owing to a warning he had received yesterday, and that the place of his sojourn was a secret. Apparently he is afraid of the results of his duel. "'Tis through you alone, then, my dear and revered friend, that I can be informed of the details which interest me, and which may become so necessary to Madame de Merteuil. I renew my prayer to you to acquaint me with them as soon as possible. P.S. My daughter's indisposition has had no consequences. She presents her respects to you. 11th of December, 1700 Letter the hundred and sixty ninth, the Chevalier d'Anceny to Madame de Rosemonde. Madame, perhaps you will think the step I am taking today very unusual, but I entreat you to hear before you judge me, and to see neither boldness nor temerity where only respect and confidence is meant. I do not deny the injury I have done you, and I should not pardon myself for it all my life if I could think for a moment that it had been possible for me to avoid it. Be even persuaded, madame, that, if I am exempt from reproach, I am not equally so from regrets, and I may add, with equal sincerity, that those which I have caused you count for much in those which I feel. In order to believe in these sentiments, of which I venture to assure you, it will suffice for you to render justice to yourself, and to reflect that, without having the honour of being known to you, I have, however, that of knowing you. Meanwhile, whilst I groan over the fatality which has been the cause at once of your grief and my misfortunes, I have been led to fear that, absorbed in your vengeance, you would seek out means of gratifying it, even through the severity of the laws. Allow me, first, to point out to you on this subject, that here you are led astray by your sorrow, 
since my interest in this matter is essentially at one with that of Monsieur de Valmont, and that he would himself be involved in the condemnation which you would have provoked against me. I believe then, madame, that I can count on assistance, rather than on obstacles on your part, in any efforts I may be obliged to make, so that this unhappy event may remain buried in silence. But this resource of complicity, which befits the innocent and the guilty alike, is not sufficient for my delicacy. While desiring to remove you as a party to the suit, I demand you as my judge. The esteem of persons whom we respect is too precious that I should let yours be taken from me without defending it, and I believe I possess the means. In fact, if you will admit that vengeance is allowed, or say rather that it is one's bounden duty when one has been betrayed in one's love, in one's friendship, and above all, in one's confidence. If you admit this, my wrongs against you will vanish from your eyes. Do not take my word for this, but read, if you have the courage, the correspondence which I place in your hands. Note. It is from this correspondence, from that handed over in the same way on the death of Madame de Tourvel, and from the letters alike confided to Madame de Rosemonde by Madame de Volange, that the present collection has been formed, the originals of which remain in the hands of Madame de Rosemonde's hairs. The quantity of original letters which it contains seems to lend authenticity to those of which only copies exist. For the rest, I received these letters, just as I have the honour to forward them to you, from Monsieur de Valmont himself. I have added nothing to them, and I have only extracted two letters, which I have permitted myself to publish. One of these was necessary to the common vengeance of Monsieur de Valmont and of myself. To this we had both the right, and I had been expressly charged with it by him. I thought, moreover, that I was rendering a service to society in unmasking a woman so really dangerous as is Madame de Marteuil, who, as you will see, was the sole and veritable cause of all that passed between Monsieur de Valmont and myself. A feeling of justice also induced me to publish the second, for the justification of Monsieur de Prévent, whom I hardly know, but had in no way merited the rigorous treatment which he has experienced, nor the still more redoubtable judgment of the public, beneath which he has been groaning ever since, without any means of defence. You will only find copies, then, of these two letters, the originals of which I owe it to myself to keep. For all the rest, I do not believe I can remit in surer hands a deposit, the destruction of which is not, perhaps, to my interest, but which I should blush to abuse. I believe, madam, that in confiding these papers to you, I am serving the persons interested in them as well as if I remitted them to themselves, and I spare them the embarrassment of receiving them from me, and of knowing me to be informed of adventures of which they doubtless desire all the world to remain ignorant. I think I ought to warn you on this subject, that the adjoined correspondence only forms part of a far more voluminous collection from which Monsieur de Valmont extracted it in my presence, and which you will find on the removal of the seals, under the title which I saw of Account Open Between the Marquise de Marteuil and the Vicomte de Valmont. You will adopt in this matter whatever course your prudence may suggest. I am with respect, Madame, etc. P.S. Certain information which I have received and the advice of my friends, have decided my absence from Paris for some time. But the place of my retreat, which is kept a secret for everybody, will not be one for you. If you honour me with a reply, I beg you to address it to the Commanderie de... by P... undercover to Monsieur le Commandeur de... It is from his house that I have the honour to write to you. Paris, 12th of December... In seventeen... Letter the hundred and seventieth. Madame de Volange to Madame de Rosemonde. I move, my dear friend, from surprise to surprise, and from sorrow to sorrow. One must be a mother to form an idea of what I suffered yesterday all the morning, and, if my most cruel anxiety has been calmed since... There still remains to me a keen affliction, the end of which I cannot foresee. 
yesterday, about ten o'clock in the morning, astonished that I had not yet seen my daughter, I sent my waiting-maid to know what could have occasioned her delay. She returned a moment later, highly alarmed, and alarmed me even more by informing me that my daughter was not in her apartment, and that, since the morning, her maid had not seen her there. Judge of my situation! I summoned all my people, and the porter in especial. All swore to me they knew nothing, and could give me no information upon this event. I went at once to my daughter's room. The disorder which obtained there assured me that she had apparently only gone that morning. But I found no further clue. I searched her presses, her writing-desk. I found everything in its place, and all her wardrobe, with the exception of the dress in which she had left. She had not even taken the small stock of money which she possessed. As she had only heard yesterday of all that is said of Madame de Merteuil, as she is greatly attached to her, to such a degree, indeed, that she did not but weep all the evening, as I remembered also that she did not know Madame de Merteuil was in the country, my first idea was that she had wished to see her friend, and had been so imprudent as to go alone. But the time which elapsed before her return brought back all my uneasiness. Each moment augmented my trouble, and, burning as I was for information, I dared take no steps to obtain it, for fear of giving publicity to a proceeding which, afterwards, I might wish, perhaps, to be able to hide from everybody. Never in my life have I so suffered. Finally, it was not until past two o'clock, I received at the same time a letter from my daughter, and one from the superior of the convent of. My daughter's letter only said that she had feared lest I should oppose the vocation which she felt to become a nun, and that she had not dared speak to me of it. The rest only consisted of excuses for the course she had adopted without my permission, which I would assuredly not disapprove of, she added, if I knew her motives, into which she begged me, however, not to inquire. The superior wrote to me that, seeing a young person arrive alone, she had at first refused to receive her, but that, having questioned her and learned who she was, she had thought to do me a service by giving my daughter shelter, in order not to expose her to further journeys, upon which she seemed resolved. The superior, while offering, as a matter of course, to restore my daughter to me if I were to demand her, urges me, obeying her condition, not to oppose a vocation which she declares to be firm. She told me also that she could not inform me earlier of this event, owing to the difficulty she had in making my daughter write to me, as her plan was to leave every one in ignorance of the place of her retreat. It is a cruel thing when our children argue so ill. I went immediately to the convent, and, after seeing the superior, asked to see my daughter. She only came reluctantly, and in a very tremulous state. I spoke to her before the nuns, and I spoke to her alone. All that I could extract from her, amid many tears, was that she could only be happy in the convent. I decided to let her remain there, but without entering the rank of postulants as she desired. I fear that the death of Madame de Tourvel and Monsieur de Valmont have unduly affected her young head. Whatever my respect for her religious vocation, I could not see my daughter embrace that career without sorrow, and even without alarm. Methinks we have already duties enough to perform without creating fresh ones, and, again, it is hardly at her age that we best know what befits us. What enhances my embarrassment is the nearness of M. de Gercourt's return. Must this most advantageous marriage be broken off? How, then, are we to make our children's happiness, if it is not sufficient to desire it and devote all our cares to it? You will greatly oblige me by telling me what you would do in my place. I cannot fix upon any course. I find nothing more terrible than to have to decide another's lot, and I am equally afraid of bringing to this occasion the severity of a judge, or the weakness of a mother. I reproach myself unceasingly for augmenting your sorrows by speaking to you of my own, but I know your heart, the consolation which you could give to others, 
would become to you the greatest you could yourself receive. Adieu, my dear and revered friend. I await your two replies with much impatience. Paris, December 13th, 1700 End of section 34《セクション35 of Dangerous Connections》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Dangerous Connections》by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos《セクション35》Letters 171 to 175 Letter the 171st Madame de Rosemonde to the Chevalier d'Ancenis after what you have brought to my knowledge, monsieur, nothing is left for me but to be silent and to weep. One regrets that one still lives after learning such horrors. One blushes to be a woman when one finds one capable of such excesses. I will willingly concur with you, monsieur, so far as I am concerned in leaving in silence and oblivion all that may have brought about these sad events. I even hope that they may never cause you any other grief than that inseparable from the unhappy advantage which you obtained over my nephew. In spite of his errors, I feel that I shall never console myself for his loss. But my eternal affliction will be the sole vengeance I shall permit myself to obtain from you. I leave it to your heart to appreciate its extent." If you will permit to my age a reflection which is rarely made at yours, it is that, were one enlightened as to one's true happiness, one would never seek it outside the bounds prescribed by religion and the laws. You may rest assured that I will keep faithfully and willingly the deposit you have confided to me, but I ask you to authorize me to give it up to no one, not even to you, monsieur unless it should become necessary for your justification. I venture to believe that you will not refuse me this request, and that you have already realized how often one laments for having indulged in even the most just revenge. I do not pause here in my requests. Convinced as I am of your generosity and delicacy, it would be very worthy of both of these if you were to also place in my hands the letters of Mademoiselle de Volange, which apparently you have retained, and which doubtless are of no further interest to you. I know that the young person has wronged you greatly, but I do not think that you have thought of punishing her. And were it only out of respect for yourself, you will not degrade the object you have so greatly loved." I have no need to add, then, that the consideration which the daughter does not deserve is due at any rate to the mother, to that meritorious woman in regard to whom you are not without having much to repair. For, after all, whatever illusion one may seek to impose on one's self by a pretended delicacy of sentiment, he who first attempts to seduce a heart still virtuous and simple makes himself from that fact alone the first a better of its corruption, and must be for ever responsible for the excesses and errors which ensue. Do not be surprised, monsieur, at so much severity on my part. It is the greatest proof I can give you of my complete esteem. You will acquire fresh rights to it still, by lending yourself as I desire to the security of a secret, the publication of which would do yourself a wrong and deal death to a mother's heart which you have already wounded. In a word, monsieur, I desire to do this service to my friend, and if I could be afraid that you would refuse me this consolation, I would ask you to reflect beforehand that it is the only one you have left me. I have the honor to be, etc. At the Chateau de 15th December, 17. Letter the 172nd. Madame de Rosemonde to Madame de Volange. 
had I been obliged, my dear friend, to await and receive from Paris the enlightenment which you ask me for concerning Madame de Martille, it would have been impossible for me to give it you as yet, and doubtless that which I received would have been vague and uncertain. But there has reached me information which I neither expected nor had reason to expect, and this is only too certain. Oh, my friend, how that woman has deceived you! I shrink from entering into any details of this mass of horrors, but whatever may be reported, rest assured it still falls short of the truth. I hope, my dear friend, that you know me well enough to believe my word for it, and that you will require no proofs from me. Let the knowledge suffice you that there exists a mass of them, and that at this very moment they are in my hands. It is not without extreme pain that I beseech you also not to compel me to give a reason for the advice you ask of me respecting Mademoiselle de Belange. I recommend you not to oppose the vocation she displays. Assuredly no reason can justify one in forcing such a condition of life upon one who is not called to it. But sometimes it is a great happiness that it should be so. And you see that your daughter tells you herself that you would not disapprove if you knew her motives. He who inspires our sentiments knows better than our vain wisdom what is right for each one of us, and often what seems an act of his severity is on the contrary one of his clemency. In short, my advice, which I am quite sensible will afflict you, and which from that fact alone you must believe I would not give you unless I had greatly reflected upon it, is that you should leave Mademoiselle de Valange at the convent, since this step is of her own choice, that you should encourage instead of thwarting the project she seems to have formed, and that in awaiting its execution you should not hesitate to break off the marriage you had arranged. After fulfilling these painful duties of friendship, and in the impotence in which I am to add any consolation, the one favor it remains for me to beg of you, my dear friend, is to ask me no further questions bearing in any way upon these sad events. Let us leave them in the oblivion which befits them, and without seeking to throw useless and painful lights upon them, submit ourselves to the decrees of providence and believe in the wisdom of its views, even where we are not permitted to understand them. Adieu, my dear friend. At the Chateau de 15th December, 17. Letter the 173rd Madame de Volange to Madame de Rosemonde Oh, my friend! In what fearful veil do you envelope my daughter's lot? And you seem to dread lest I seek to raise it. What, pray, can it conceal which can affect a mother's heart more than the dire suspicions to which you abandon me? The more I think of your friendship, of your indulgence, the more are my torments redoubled. Twenty times since yesterday have I tried to escape from this cruel uncertainty, and to beg you to let me know all, without considering my feelings and without reserve. And each time I shuddered with dread, when I remembered the prayer you made me not to question you. Finally, I decide upon a course which still leaves me some hope, and I depend upon your friendship not to refuse me what I ask. It is to answer me whether I have, to a certain extent, understood what you might have to tell me not to be afraid to let me know all that maternal indulgence can forgive, and which it may not be impossible to repair. If my misfortunes exceed this measure, then indeed I consent to leave you to explain yourself by silence alone. Here, then, is what I know already, and the point to which my fears extend. My daughter has shown that she had a certain inclination for the Chevalier d'Ancenis, and I have been informed that she has gone so far as to receive letters from him, and even to reply to them. But I believed I had succeeded in preventing this error of a child from having any dangerous consequences. Today, when I dread everything, I can conceive that it may have been possible for my surveillance to have been deceived, and I fear that my misguided daughter may have set a seal upon her wrongdoing. 
I recall to mind, again, several circumstances which lend weight to this fear. I told you that my daughter was taken ill at the news of Monsieur de Valmont's misfortune. Perhaps this sensitiveness was merely due to her thought of the risks Monsieur Danceny had run in this combat. Afterwards, when she shed so many tears on learning all that was said of Madame de Merteuil, perhaps what I thought to be the grief of friendship was but the effect of jealousy, or of regret at finding her lover to be unfaithful. Her latest course may again, it seems to me, be explained by the same motive. It often happens that one believes oneself called to God, only because one has revolted against men. Finally, supposing these facts to be true, and that you have been informed of them, you may have found them sufficient to justify the rigorous counsel you gave me. However, if this be so, whilst blaming my daughter, I should still believe it my duty to try every means to save her from the torments and dangers of an illusory and transient vocation. If M. Danceny is not lost to every sentiment of honour, he will not refuse to repair a wrong of which he is the sole author, and I am entitled to believe that a marriage with my daughter is sufficiently advantageous to gratify him as well as his family. This, my dear and revered friend, is the one hope remaining to me. Hasten to confirm it if you can. You may judge how desirous I am that you should reply to me, and what a terrible blow your silence would inflict. Note, this letter was left unanswered. I was about to close my letter when a gentleman of my acquaintance came to see me and related the cruel scene which Madame de Merteuil underwent the day before yesterday. As I have seen nobody for the last few days, I knew nothing of this adventure. Here is the relation of it, as I have it from an eyewitness. Madame de Merteuil, on her return from the country on Thursday, alighted at the Italian comedy, where she had her box. She was alone in it, and, what must have seemed most extraordinary to her, no gentleman of her acquaintance presented himself during the performance. At the close, she entered the withdrawing-room, as was her custom. It was already crowded. A hum was raised immediately, but apparently she was not aware that she was the object of it. She saw a vacant place on one of the benches, and went and sat there. But at once all the women who were there before her rose, as if in concert, and left her absolutely alone. This marked sign of general indignation was applauded by all the men, and the murmurs, which even amounted, it is said, to hooting, were redoubled. That nothing might be lacking to her humiliation, her ill luck had it that Monsieur de Prévan, who had shown himself nowhere since his adventure, should enter the withdrawing room that same moment. As soon as he was recognized, everybody, men and women, surrounded and applauded him, and he was carried, so to speak, in face of Madame de Merteuil by the crowd, which made a circle round them. I was assured that Madame de Merteuil preserved an appearance of seeing and hearing nothing, and that she did not change her expression, but I think this fact exaggerated. Be that as it may, this truly ignominious situation lasted until her carriage was announced, and, at her departure, the scandalous hooting was redoubled. It is fearful to be related to such a woman. M. de Prévan met with a great reception the same evening from all the officers of his regiment who were present, and there is no doubt but that he will shortly regain his rank and employment. The same person who gave me these details told me that Madame de Merteuil was seized the following night with a violent fever, which was at first thought to be the effect of the terrible situation in which she had been placed. But it became known yesterday that confluent smallpox had declared itself of a very dangerous kind. Truly, it would be a piece of good fortune for her if she were to die of it. They say, further, that all this adventure will damage her case, which is on the point of being tried, and in which they assert that she had need of much favour. Adieu, my dear and revered friend. I see the wicked punished in all this, but I find no consolation in it for their unfortunate victims. Paris December 18th, 1700 Letter the 174th 
The Chevalier d'Anceny to Madame de Rosemonde. You are right, madam, and certainly I will refuse you nothing within my power to which you attach any value. The packet which I have the honour to forward you contains all Mademoiselle de Volange's letters. If you read them, you will see, not without astonishment perhaps, what a wealth of perfidy and ingenuousness can be united. That is, at least, what struck me most on my last perusal of them. Above all, can one refrain from the liveliest indignation against Madame de Merteuil, when one reflects with what a hideous pleasure she brought all her pains to bear on the corruption of so much innocence and candor? No, my love is dead. I retain nothing of a sentiment so basely betrayed, and it is not that which makes me seek to justify Mademoiselle de Volange. Nevertheless, would not that simple heart, that gentle and pliable character, have been influenced for good more easily even than they were seduced to evil? What young person, issuing similarly from a convent, without experience and almost without ideas, and bringing into the world, as almost always happens then, an equal ignorance of good and evil. What young person, I say, would have been able to offer more resistance to such culpable artifices? Ah, uh, to be indulgent, it suffices to reflect upon how many circumstances beyond our own control the terrible alternative between the delicacy and the deprivation of our sentiments depends. You rendered justice to me, then, madame, in deeming that the wrongs of Mademoiselle de Volange, which I felt most keenly, did not, however, inspire me with any ideas of vengeance. It is quite enough to be obliged to renounce my love of her. It will cost me too much to hate her. I needed no reflection to desire that all which concerns and could harm her should remain forever unknown to the world. If I have seemed to delay the fulfilment of your desires in this matter, I think I need not conceal my motive from you. I wish to be sure, beforehand, that I was not to be troubled with the consequences of my unfortunate duel. At the time when I was craving your indulgence, when I even dared believe I had some right to it, I should have feared to have too much the appearance of buying it by this condescension on my part, and convinced of the purity of my motives, I was proud enough, I will confess, to wish you to be left in no doubt of them. I hope you will pardon this delicacy, perhaps too susceptible, in view of the veneration which you inspire in me, and the value which I attach to your esteem. It is the same sentiment which bids me ask of you, as a last favour, to be so good as to let me know if, in your judgment, I have fulfilled all the duties which have been imposed upon me by the unhappy circumstances in which I was placed. Once at ease in this respect, my intention is fixed. I leave for Malta. I will go there to make gladly and keep religiously the vows which will separate me from a world of which, while still so young, I have had such good reason to complain. I shall go, in short, to seek to lose beneath an alien sky, the thought of so many accumulated horrors whose memory could only sadden and wither my soul. I am with respect, madame, your most humble, etc. Paris, 26th of December, in 17... Letter the 175th, Madame de Volange to Madame de Rosemonde. The fate of Madame de Merteuil, my dear and revered friend, seems to be at length complete, and it is such that her greatest enemies are divided between the indignation she merits and the pity she inspires. I was right, indeed, in saying that it would be a happiness for her to die of her smallpox. She has recovered, it is true, but she has been fearfully disfigured, and, in particular, she has lost an eye. You will imagine that I have not seen her, but I am told that she is really hideous. The Marquis de... 
who never misses an occasion for saying something malicious, said yesterday, in speaking of her, that the disease had transformed her, and that now her soul was to be seen in her face. Unhappily, every one found the expression just. A further event has just come to add to her disgrace and to her prejudice. Her case was tried yesterday, and the verdict was given against her unanimously. Costs, damages, restitution of the funds received, all was adjudged to the miners. So that the small remnant of her fortune which was not compromised in this case is absorbed, and more than absorbed, by the costs. Immediately she received this intelligence, although still sick, she made her arrangements and started off at night, alone and posting. Her servants say to-day that none of them would follow her. It is believed she has taken the road to Holland. This departure makes more noise than all the rest, from the fact that she has carried off her diamonds, a possession of great value, which should have returned to her husband's succession. Her plate, jewels, in short, everything that she could, and that she leaves behind her nearly fifty thousand livres of debt. It is a real bankruptcy. The family is to assemble to-morrow to make arrangements with the creditors. Although only a distant relation, I have offered to contribute, but I shall not be present at this assembly, having to assist at an even sadder ceremony. To-morrow my daughter takes the habit of a postulant. I hope that you will not forget, my dear friend, that, in making this great sacrifice, I have no other motive for being compelled to it than the silence which you have maintained towards me. M. Danceny left Paris nearly a fortnight ago. It is said that he is on his way to Malta, where it is his intention to remain. There would be still time, perhaps, to recall him. My friend, my daughter is guilty indeed, then. You will forgive a mother, no doubt, for only yielding to this awful certainty with difficulty. What a fatality has fallen upon me of late, and stricken me in the objects dearest to me, my daughter and my friend. Who is there who would not shudder, if he were to reflect upon the misfortunes that may be caused by even one dangerous association? And what troubles would one not avert by reflecting on this more often? What woman would not fly before the first proposal of a seducer? What mother could see another person than herself speak to her daughter, and tremble not? But these tardy reflections never come until after the event, and one of the most important of truth, as it is, perhaps, one of the most generally recognized, lies stifled and void of use in the whirlpool of our inconsequent manners. Adieu, my dear and revered friend. I feel at this moment that our reason, which is already so insufficient to avert our misfortunes, is even more inadequate to console us for them. Note private reasons and considerations, which we shall ever make it a duty to respect, force us to hold here. We cannot, at this moment, give our reader the continuation of Mademoiselle de Volange's adventures, nor acquaint him with the sinister events which culminated the misfortunes, or completed the punishment, of Madame de Merteuil. Perhaps some day it will be in our power to complete this work, but we can give no undertaking in this matter. And, even were we able to do so, we should still deem it our duty first to consult the taste of the public, which has not our reasons for taking an interest in this narration. End of note. Paris, January 14th, 1700 End of section 35 End of Dangerous Connections by Pierre Coderlo de la Clos